thought I was on camera. I'm not. Okay, there we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Yes, one second. Sorry about that. I promise I am fully dressed. Um, welcome to the budget hearing for the, uh, the Subcommittee on Health and Social Services. Today we have four budgets to discuss. Um, the uh, Department of Aging, the administration budget for the Department of Human Services, the administration budget for the Department of Health, and the um, Department of Health's uh, FIPA budget. And I apologize if, uh, if uh, I can never remember the acronym, but it's the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration. Um, couple reminders for everyone. Um, this is being streamed live. That means everything said, shown, and typed into the chat box is both visible to, the, um, to all the folks at home as well as uh, accessed as a public record. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you participate. Um, we, we let people into, we pretty much let everybody in at the same time if you're scheduled to testify. Um, but we will have you remain um, muted until it's your turn. Um, just as a quick reminder to everyone, uh, after the budget hearings, we will have a very, very brief uh, um, voting session on one bill uh, that the subcommittee uh, members need to stick around for. So with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. As always, we start with the uh, Department of Legislative Services analysis, questions, the department's response, questions to the department, um, and, uh, and then anybody uh, uh, signed up to testify publicly uh, as well. So we'll go from there. We're going to start with the, um, the Department of Aging, and uh, Grace Pedersen, please take away with your analysis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's my pleasure to present the Department of Aging's fiscal 2023 budget analysis. Uh, the budget decreases 6.6 .6 million from the fiscal 2022 working appropriation. And this is mostly driven by um, the availability of federal stimulus funds in fiscal 22 that do not continue as substantially into 23. But this is partially offset by the availability of some general fund enhancements in certain programs. I'll discuss the enhancement funding later in the presentation, but um, looking at the federal stimulus funding specifically, in fiscal 22, there's almost 20 million of the coronavirus relief funds available for um, the programs listed in this exhibit. In 23, um, there's about $6 million uh, in federal funds uh, available for these programs in addition to the base allocations um, the state receives from the federal government. And after fiscal 23, there's expected to be um, almost 7 million in unexpended um, stimulus funds. So DLS is asking the agency to comment when they expect to use that um, remaining federal stimulus funding. Moving to the fiscal 23 budget discussion, most of the budget goes towards Various programs listed here, and about half is uh, supported by federal, uh, various federal funds, uh, federal programs. Looking at Exhibit 3, um, there's some notable fluctuations in specific programs. So I mentioned there was um, $6 million in enhancement funding um, that are general funds. There's also general funds provided for the Community for Life program, um, doubling that appropriation in fiscal 23. It's funded at um, $300,000, but in uh, fiscal in fiscal 22, it's 300,000, but in fiscal 23, it increases to 600,000. Um, there's a new aging in place mandate um, that adds 100,000 general funds to the budget and the durable medical equipment reuse program almost, also increases by almost 100,000. Um, another new program, the senior call check program, um, that appropriation uh, decreases almost 100,000 um, from fiscal 22. Uh, the breakdown of each specific program's funding fluctuation is provided in Exhibit 4. Um, and then just looking at personnel, uh, there's a couple updates here. So the number of regular positions uh, remains stable from fiscal 22, but uh, the department gains four contractuals um, in 
uh, fiscal 23. And then the, um, the budget turnover rate is reduced by half. So it's um, budgeted at 10% in fiscal 22, and then it's reduced to 5% in um, fiscal 23. And this is notable because the department's vacancies substantially exceed this, this revised rate. Um, and the department currently has three long-term um, vacancies, but they're actively recruiting for each of those vacant positions. Now, moving to the key observations, uh, the first one is about the general fund enhancement um, enhancements available in fiscal 23. So $3 million of, so a total of 6 million are provided for four purposes. So uh, half of it is for information and assistance. And the department indicated that um, the, this funding will be used for broad purposes associated with improving services to seniors, um, capturing additional um, federal financial participation for Medicaid related activities, um, increasing staffing at the AAAs and supporting Maryland access point. But beyond this, there was limited information about how the department would use this funding um, at the time the analysis was written. So DLS recommends to restrict the um, funding pending receipt of a report, um, providing a spending plan about how they um, plan to use this additional $3 million. Um, the other $3 million of the enhancement funding uh, supports a 20% increase in the appropriation for the senior care, the senior assisted living subsidy, and the congregate housing services program. Um, looking at exhibit six, this is a breakdown of the uh, wait list totals for each of those programs and um, how oversubscribed each program is in relation to the fiscal 21 participation and um, notably senior care and a senior assisted living, the senior assisted living subsidy are oversubscribed by more than 30% uh, of um, fiscal 21 participation levels. Looking at key observation two, this um, looks at the department's long-term care ombudsman and public guardianship programs. So exhibit seven shows data about the um, number of complaints investigated and closed by the ombudsman. And in 2020, there was a notable increase and the department attributes this to um, potentially uh, decreased trust in long-term care facility staff in um, the early pandemic months. And then interestingly, um, fiscal federal fiscal 21 levels of complaints are also affected by the pandemic. And the decrease there is um, likely associated with staffing shortages and reduced visitation to um, long-term care facilities. The public guardianship program has also been affected by the pandemic. Um, and you can see here this blue line, the um, department's public guardianship caseload decreases by about 160 um, guardianships. And um, the department or the AAAs could be appointed guardians for individuals when there's no other um, appropriate guardian identified. So for this program, it's a relatively um, notable decrease, especially considering that the guardianship caseload has been relatively stable in recent years. Um, and this is also um, kind of reflective of a, a larger change statewide in red um, that's showing new petitions for guardianships um, statewide, which saw a decrease in um, the pandemic years as well. Looking at the, um, the third issue, this is an update on the department's uh, three major new programs. So the first one is um, senior call check. And um, even though the um, spending decreases by um, 95,000 in um, this year, the, um, the program is funded by Universal Services Trust Funds. And um, the Universal Services Trust Fund is supported by a um, a monthly five cent um, telecommunications subscriber sur surcharge um, on phone bills. Um, and it supports, in addition to accessible phone services, also the senior call tech program. And um, the Department of Disabilities currently administers the fund and they project that if spending um, and revenue levels are remain the same at uh, fiscal 23 levels, there could be a shortfall um, as early as fiscal 26. Um, so even though spending decreases, um, there could be um, concern in the, in the out years for the, um, for the fund. So DLS is recommending that um, the Department of Aging coordinate with the Department of Disabilities um, to submit a report about uh, senior call check um, program utilization as well as expenditures in that program. Then um, moving to the second new program, the Community for Life program, um, this exhibit is showing utilization of that program, as well as um, expenditures for each grantee. And you can see here that um, 
no grantee has more than um, 60 participants, but some grantees have already incurred um, substantial expenditures um, in excess of uh, $200,000 or more. Then the last program I'm gonna discuss is the Durable Medical Equipment Reuse Program. So this program um, accepts donations of durable medical equipment, refurbishes the equipment, and then redistributes the equipment to the public at no uh, cost. And um, the program's implementation has been affected by the pandemic and they could really only operate, um, have limited operations during pandemic months. But um, recently the um, program has become more public facing. And um, as of January, um, over $400,000 worth of equipment has been distributed. Um, however, this is um, far short of the investments in the program to date, uh, which exceed two and a half million. And then the fiscal 23 allowance proposes to add um, an additional 1.2 investment, 1.2 million investment in this program. Um, so um, DLS also recommends a report on um, data about utilization of the community for life and the durable medical equipment reuse program to make sure those uh, those programs are uh, operating in the, the most cost effective way and it's the most cost effective way to provide those kinds of services to individuals. Um, this is a recommendation about um, restricting the uh, three million for information and assistance pending a um, submission of a spending plan. Uh, the second recommendation is about uh, waitlist data in light of this um, 3 million that's available across the senior care, senior assisted living subsidy and the congregate housing services program. And then the third recommendation is that um, update on community for life and the durable medical equipment reuse program. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Grace. Um, any questions for the analyst? Delegate Henson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Grace, thank you for the excellent report. How many people are enrolled in the Community for Life program? I believe the most recently updated data uh, said there were 186 um, participants statewide. And if I'm understanding the presentation correct, there the budget will be $6 million in the upcoming year. That's a proposal for 186 people. Um, so the, the budget for uh, fiscal 23 is 600,000. Pardon and me. That's okay. And the program, um, I probably should have explained this in more detail. The program provides seed grants to nonprofit grantees. So the state provides a, um, a one-time investment and then the nonprofits are responsible for administering the program and they could see expenditures in um, excess of the, the grant funds. Um, so um, the department could probably expand on the proposed uses of the 600,000 in fiscal 23 and whether it's going to go to new grantees or um, existing grantees. Thank you, Grace. That, that, that solves, that provides a lot of clarity. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Valentino Smith. So, uh, Grace, an excellent um, presentation. Thank you. And just following up on Delegate Henson, then I think in Exhibit 9 on page 13, the description that we're getting from you all says when looking at grantee expenditures, including those drawing from other revenue sources, less the value of revenue from membership dues expenditures for each member rises to $12,051 per member. We will ask the department, but that's not a mistake, is it? And it's not a typo? Um, no, that's just a rough okay. estimate. So that's basically aggregating all the expenditures that grantees have made, combining both the, the state um, grant funding as well as the independent um, expenditures that they've made from their own sources, whether it be the grant. That's almost $1,000 a month per, per participant? Um, correct, that, that's the rough estimate, um, dividing total expenditures by the number of participants. Thank you, I think that's why Delegate Henson sparked my interest in that exhibit. Thank you, Delegate Henson for doing that. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Grace. I have a, a couple of quick questions uh, on the vacancies. How how long term have those vacancies been? Um, so a long term vacancy is considered anything um, over one year. I could pull up. I believe I may have listed the dates. Um, okay. So um, one of them has been vacant since June 2019. Another one is September 2020. And then the third long-term vacancy has been vacant since October 2020. 
So of the three positions that are actively being recruited, two of them have been actively recruited for two years and one has been actively recruited for three years. There was a hiring freeze, but um, the department could probably comment um, better than I could about their recruiting right. approach. Okay. Uh, where was the hiring freeze in that time period? Do you remember? Um, the hiring freeze was list lifted for a lot of agencies in uh, calendar 2021. I don't know the specific date for okay. the Department of Aging. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and then uh, on the question of the wait lists, um, the additional funding this year, what would that, if we can go back to that real quick, what would that do to the wait list? Does, it, does the additional funding eliminate the wait list? Does it reduce it by a certain percentage? What does the additional funding do to the wait list? The department indicated that they would allow the AAAs to have flexibility in how they, um, they manage the additional funding. So they could either make the existing, um, um, the number of participants um, that already exist in the program, uh, provide them with more um, robust benefits and increase the, the value of the benefit there, or they could uh, increase the number of participants. So um, the department could comment if they're aware of any trends and how um, the AAAs prepared are preparing to use the funding, but it's going to vary. Um, they have the flexibility to either provide more generous benefits or increase the number of participants in the program. Got it. Thank you. And then one last question, something I noticed, could you throw back up the uh, Communities for Life graphic that you had? Yes. Okay. That one. Okay. So, I'm not seeing the, um, the um, indications. What's green and yellow? Oh, sorry. It's a little too zoomed in. Um, so the green is the, um, the expenditures uh, as of July, 2021. And then the yellow represents um, the amount of unencumbered state grant funding that's still available to each of these grantees. Got it. So if I'm reading this correctly for the last year, a grantee in Montgomery County has gotten the largest amount of any county, $600,000, and has had zero participants. Um, so they're still getting the program off the ground and they were established in um, fiscal 2021. So um, I think that's just reflecting that they haven't become public facing yet. They're still putting in the program and infrastructure to make it ready to go. Okay, that's clear. Thank you so much. All right, I appreciate that. Um, any other questions for uh, Grace? Seeing none, let's move to the department. With us is Senator Rona Kramer. Senator, do you have other folks from your department that you'd like to introduce? I do. I believe we have with us our Chief of Staff, Pam Seidel, and Alexandra Baldy, our legislative liaison. Welcome. Thank well, you. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. It's great to be with you. I would first like to thank uh, Ms. Pedersen for her very thorough analysis and the time that it's taken, and it does take a great deal of time to understand our programs, specifically some of the innovations that are very new and uh, uh, she, something that has not been part of the budget previously uh, to uh, this administration. So thank you very much for taking that time and learning so well. Uh, to start, the first uh, discussion item was that uh, MDOA anticipates having $6.9 million in ARPA funds uh, remaining after 2023, and those we expect to be spent in uh, fiscal year 24. And when I say we, it is uh, in large part the area agencies on aging. Discussion number, uh, item number two, is that we concur with a senior call check report. Uh, I can come back, uh, if you would like, at the end of the, the discussion to discuss the uh, positions, should you like. I noted them at the start, but let's uh, take that to the end of discussion. Discussion item number three is about the uh, Durable Medical Equipment Program, which has been a greater success than we had even imagined. Uh, I would very much like 
for all of you in the legislature to please come and visit. It is in Cheltenham in Prince George's County is our headquarters where we have a 55,000 square foot warehouse. And um, it is extremely impressive. We, when uh, we've noted the amount of equipment that we have distributed, there are many uses that it did not include, one of which was throughout the pandemic when the various jurisdictions throughout the state opened their vaccine uh, programs uh, and vaccine centers, they contacted us because they all needed wheelchairs and many of them borrowed wheelchairs from the Durable Medical Equipment Center. We loaned a hundred chairs to vaccination centers across the state, free of charge, no procurement that had to be done and no expenditures, very quick and easy for our local governments as well as the state's gov state government's use. Uh, we were asked to discuss how we intend to continue uh, the program public awareness. I can tell you we have used every method that we can think of to date and continue to do so, and we will. Uh, we outreach to, we've outreached already and continue to all Maryland hospitals all nursing homes and assisted living facilities on a regular basis. We've met with, we speak at meetings of their professional associations. We continue to expand our landfill program where we put sea containers at landfills. All we've had to do is uh, put one at a landfill, put our sign up, and we found that it is filling up very, very quickly there. So uh, people were on their way to dump wheelchairs and other DME into the landfill. And we pick it up, bring it back, sanitize it to national standards, uh, repair the equipment, and then give it back out free to the public. We now have many of those sites throughout the state and continue to negotiate agreements with various jurisdictions so that we can expand those sites. We also have numerous sites throughout the state for distribution as well as donations of equipment. So our residents don't have to travel to Cheltenham, they can go to a regional center and they are using those. Uh, we advertise on our trucks. We uh, advertise in senior newsletters as well as others. And we hope that you as legislators will take the articles that we've sent to you about the program and uh, even the pictures and include it in your newsletters so that your constituents know that this service is available to them, free durable medical equipment. We've advertised to many organizations, veterans organizations. We've met with them. I've met with them. Our director of our program, Dr. Edwards, has met with them uh, and uh, Lions Clubs, Rotaries throughout the state. We're also working very closely with any other organizations that have their own loan closets, including the Lions Club, who are very active in this. And uh, we have offered our services to them. If they would like, we can much more professionally sanitize and, return, and repair equipment and then return it back to them so that they can use it to distribute the way they do throughout the state. And they're a wonderful organization. And that way we provide some assistance to them and they assist us in getting that equipment back out to the public. We may have to do some paid advertising. To date, we have not. We'll see, my preference is not to have to, but if we must, we'll keep that in mind. And a tremendous benefit that we had not anticipated when we started this program, because our goal was mobility, to provide mobility to the public. And this is Marylanders of all ages, though this program is under the Department of Aging, it is a program that supports members of all ages of uh, the Maryland community. And we have a specific uh, pediatric section 
of our uh, warehouse for specifically pediatric equipment and children grow, change inside, need new equipment all the time and frequently uh, more often than insurance will pay to upgrade their equipment. So this has been a, a great benefit. Um, so, and we've had many partners. Uh, we've been working with the Kernan Institute uh, in University of Maryland to provide very specific $20,000 wheelchairs to some of their uh, some of their patients to provide mobility uh, for them. And they have, uh, they made, I believe we even have a letter from them in your package for the hearing, but they are a tremendous partner and have been very pleased with the partnership with our DME Center. The recommendation one uh, ha is that uh, the uh, DLS re recommended restricting $3 million for the information and assistance until MDOA submitted a spending plan. And uh, Ms. Pedersen gave us a list of very specific questions. They were excellent questions. We have met with our AAAs and responded to those in great detail with specifics about what each Area Agency on Aging uh, believes they can do with the additional funding. That funding is intended to hire new staff. We've had an exploding population of older adults and we have not had the opportunity to hire new staff to answer the phone and to create uh, care plans for our residents. And so this will allow us to bring on the staff necessary to do that. Um, we, um, and uh, they are uh, INA staff, sometimes they're referred to as um, uh, MAP staff. They're also uh, options counselors. So it's, they're the people who are the direct line interaction with the public as they begin to inform the public about what we do, what services we provide. And then for our lower income, uh, older adults they are, then options counselors can move on to provide care plans. Um, the funding, we would much prefer that there not be a delay in that funding. It is your area agencies on aging who will receive all of this funding and they would like to believe, begin the hiring as soon as possible, uh, beginning uh, July 1. And so if we can answer your questions now, they will not have a delay in the ability to bring on that new staff that they very much need. This funding will also allow us to bring in uh, an additional 800,000 plus in federal participation funding, which will also serve our area agencies well. So we very much hope that there is no reason now to delay that uh, distribution. Recommendation two uh, is the uh, uh, provide biannual reports on the enhanced funding. We concur. Recommendation three is the reports on uh, CFL and DME, and we concur. I would like to note that um, our Community for Life, there were a number of questions program. We hope now that the pandemic had, has moved into a less severe uh, uh, segment and that we can be getting back out in the public and interacting with our older adults, that the colors on the bar graph that you've seen will be changing. The heroes in this program have been our nonprofit providers. Many of them have sent you letters. They're the ones who have picked up the expenditures to carry this program during a time when COVID has prevented us from being able to fully expand. Our programs bring the services that are necessary 
to, for older adults to be able to remain at home for years longer than they can without our support. Our, um, uh, the administration for community living has recognized that this is spot on to what they want to be doing. That's our big federal funder. Uh, Medicaid has recognized that this is something that should save tremendous funding uh, in the future for Medicaid, because for every Medicaid recipient who is in a nursing home, which is the next step, once they've spent down, if they should go into assisted living, if they can no longer stay at home, our average Marylander, the retired teacher, retired firefighters, police officers, small business people, they spend down within an average of two years in assisted living and no longer have any of their own funds. This program moves the services upstream and allows them to stay at home many years longer. And, um, and, but the services that we provide in order to do that require being in close contact with the older adults. And the pandemic has made that impossible. So we provide home maintenance, which means that our community handy person has to go into their home. And for uh, almost two years now, we've only been able to turn the spigot on for that and allow it to happen very intermittently during the pandemic. And for most of that time, they've not been able to provide that service. We provide transportation. And most of our older adults have been rightly very cautious about getting into a vehicle with someone else during the pandemic. So many of our providers have been creative. They've brought services to outside of the home, um, but they're the ones who've maintained the bulk of the cost of this program because they had staff that they had to pay throughout the pandemic. They've maintained that expense for us. So what we've put in, what you see is unspent is because our nonprofits have been carrying those costs. And uh, it has, we have not spent $12,000 per person. We haven't even spent the 4,600, I believe, uh, that was noted um, because our nonprofits are carrying so much of those costs. And, uh, and to be frank, Many, many of our programs, uh, senior care for one, we have many times in our programs where we spend $13,000, $11,000, $20,000 a year to keep people out of a nursing home, which costs $100,000 a year to Medicaid, 50,000 of that being Maryland's Medicaid. But it is uh, because the funding has been held until we could open fully and Montgomery County is the perfect example. Uh, they're doing the Montgomery County Provider Partners in Care is doing the infrastructure. They're putting the staffing together to start the program, but we can't meet in person with our seniors uh, to sell the program, to bring them in and we can't bring services into their home until I think now, maybe this coming couple of weeks, we'll be able to open. It's actually extremely impressive that we've kept the 200 residents and many of them have come on even during the pandemic that we have throughout the pandemic. So um, I'm happy to take additional questions, but I think that sheds some light on where we are and, uh, and the program is getting uh, national attention in that it does, uh, there is great faith that this is going to be doing what we intend it to do. And we are working now with CRISP in Maryland uh, and um, one of, and our, uh, right now it's Johns Hopkins to, um, to do an analysis of the program. So we can actually see how many people we're keeping out of emergency rooms and therefore hospitalizations with broken bones and therefore nursing homes. So we are working towards having a very sophisticated uh, evaluation as well that you'll need and we need 
to know that the program works. All right. I think that responds to each of the written questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Delegate Henson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kramer, for the presentation. Um, looking at the Community for Life program, so picking up where you just left off, I saw and understanding it better that there are membership dues that are associated with the program. And then I saw that there's also an opportunity for a subsidy. So the first part of my question is, of the 186 participants, how many of them are having their dues subsidized? Now, when you, I don't know the exact number and uh, Ms. Baldy might know that. I don't know if she has that, but I don't know the exact number. Our nonprofits, when they joined this program and, um, and agreed to be part of Community for Life, all said that they would give subsidies to uh, the, any members that they could afford to subsidize. Um, who could not afford the full fee. I can tell you that I know at least one of our programs, well, two of them, um, Keswick in Baltimore City and um, our program uh, in uh, Worcester County subsidize almost everyone at this point. They are working to bring on the members who don't require subsidy. So we have many of them, I would say probably at this point, probably uh, at least a hundred of them have some subsidy at this point. And we're working <laughs> with them to bring on those that can pay in full. And in full, we're only talking $200 a month for uh, four hours of home maintenance service, service navigation, where they have their own uh, an individual who gets to know them, does a safety check of their home, and then calls them at least once a month and far more if they need it, and is their, um, uh, their concierge to all the services that are available in the community. So whether that's a Boy Scout, Girl Scout program, or church programs that are available to help them, or maybe one of our Area Agency on Aging programs. That is uh, the person who is the expert in their jurisdiction to all those programs that are available to them. And then we check in to determine whether there's abuse. We can, where our, our service navigators are highly trained uh, in a program that has been designed uh, by our universities to train them so that they can recognize abuse, they can recognize isolation. And if they call one of the members who's isolated, they move them, help them to get involved in a program. Thank you so much for that explanation. I would, I'm really interested in the follow-up on that data just to better understand how the subsidies are being utilized. And then I think you did an excellent job at highlighting some of the differences and the changes that are brought on by the pandemic. And we all know that one of those is just the value of a dollar, you know, with the prices that are increasing and everything that's happening. We've just seen so many shifts there. And so $200 a month, um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of relative on if that's affordable or if that's something that could be cost exclusive for some communities and some people. So I'll be really interested to take a look at that subsidy data. Thank you for the answer. I appreciate it. Abs certainly. And one other thing you need to know is that these, these services that we're bringing in this program are very similar to services that we bring to lower income residents who can't afford that subsidy through our Area Agency on Aging programs. So all of those other programs that you see in our budget are really to provide those services, senior care, assistance in um, the financial assistance, for subsidies for uh, congregate housing and for uh, assisted living. All of those are available to lower income Marylanders. What we're trying to do is fill the gap for those middle income Marylanders who don't qualify for a lot of the programs that we already provide, but within two years of having to go into assisted living, they'll spend down. So, uh, and it's that, and then we prevent them from needing 
our other services that we're already providing to uh, our very important and uh, much um, needy uh, residents where we provide our area agency on aging services. We're trying to prevent any gap and to prevent people from spending down and then being forced to be on wait lists with the people who are already in need of our other services. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, we have witnesses today uh, on this budget. Let me bring that up. Um, we will call up Heather Mes Meschetti Lozuponi of the Durable Medical Equipment Reuse Program. Is she part of the department or is she a separate organization? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, yes, my name is Heather. I am actually um, a physical therapist at the University of Maryland Rehab and Orthopedic Institute, um, formerly known as Kernan. So we are one of the organizations that actually get to use the Maryland Reuse Program. Um, I currently work on a unit that specializes in the rehabilitation of patients following spinal cord injury. And the Maryland Reuse Program has really been um, an incredible tool for us and resource for the staff and the patients, um, mostly the staff because we're able to seek, excuse me, One, two, three, four, five. we're this able to death. orchestrate One, two, three, um, safer four, discharges five. to the home and community for our patients um, with the tools that the Maryland Reuse Program is able to offer us. Uh, with insurance guidelines becoming more stringent and the supply chain demands that obviously have been impacted by COVID, it has become increasingly difficult for us to procure the equipment necessary for our complex patients to safely return home. Um, our patients, most of them use some type of a wheelchair when they leave here, a mechanical lift, um, hospital beds, anything you can really think of. And the reuse program has given us a way out, so to speak, of the restrictions of uh, private insurers without having to prolong our patients' length of stays, compromise their safety, or feel pressured into transitioning to a lower level of care when we can't meet their needs. Um, a specific case that I've actually had with the Maryland Reuse Program, I had an elderly patient who was paralyzed in all four limbs. Uh, he was unable to do anything for himself and his elderly sister had elected to be his caregiver for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, but his insurance only covered a manu manual lift and the caregiver was unable to safely and effectively use that for him to get home. Um, because of that and their own financial uh, resource restrictions, um, they were put in kind of this predicament of, do we transition to a step down rehab where there really was no end date in sight because of this need that wasn't going to be met by their insurance? Um, which would tax their emotional and financial kind of means, or would they transition home knowing that that would place this undue burden on the, the caregiver and then put them in a predicament of future injury as well. So thanks to the Maryland Reuse Program, we were able to efficiently apply and pick up a fully electric lift that allowed that patient to go home safely with his caregiver. Um, and today I can happily say that they're still using it every day and the patient is now having their highest quality of life versus any alternate option that we had at that given time. Um, him and his caregiver continue to express endless gratitude for the program. Um, and we frequently share that kind of knowledge with others. Um, so we continue to embrace and utilize the reuse program and their incredible supply of equipment. All right, thank you. Um, next on the list is Janet Brown. Ms. Brown, are you with us? Oh, yes, there you are. Sure, I'm just uh, unmuting. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I refer you to my written testimony as I know there's time constraint here. Uh, let me share you, uh, with you my story. I am a retired physician. My husband, also a physician, uh, dermatologist, uh, unfortunately contracted MS 50 years ago and landed in a wheelchair 30 years ago. He continued to practice medicine with the benefit of his durable medical equipment. 
It was a lifesaver. Um, he unfortunately passed away in June. And because I am uh, uh, a, a child of the waste not, want not generation, I went to great lengths to try to match his $100,000 power wheelchair with a recipient who could use it. It was next to impossible. Uh, fortunately, I heard through the grapevine uh, because of a nonprofit agency of this DME reuse program. Uh, and uh, two, well, three power wheelchairs of my husband went into the program. So I put a dollar amount on it since you all, I was listening to your budget. So I think it would help for you to understand. Um, why is DME important? Well, this is kind of basic, but it's worth going over. It's all about safety and it's all about functionality. Um, as Heather explained, it's a dangerous business to transfer a 185 pound husband from wheelchair to bed and back. It's dangerous for him. It's dangerous for me as his caregiver. And the right equipment matched to the uh, clinical problem uh, can mitigate uh, people getting hurt uh, and uh, causing extra expenditures. Functionality was key. My husband still practiced out of his wheelchair. He's a dermatologist and uh, he made it to 65. Thus, he was an active member of society. Uh, he was able to care for patients and he had that emotional piece of, of feeling of benefit to society. This is a costly, uh, um, it, this is a costly um, a problem that everyone with a disability faces. Um, so let me give you another example. My husband uh, sat in a wheelchair all day long and pressure sores became an issue. Um, and we found that uh, a tilt and space shower chair uh, eliminated them. That $6,000 piece of equipment was not covered at all by insurance. We could afford it, but I dare say there are not too many Marylanders who can. And um, it, it seems a shame to see a lot of this equipment end up in the landfill when it's engineered for longevity. But uh, if we can match the, the people in need to, to the equipment, it's a beautiful uh, process. Well, no one wants to spend government money, my tax dollars in particular, if somebody else can do the job. So nonprofits have uh, filled this um, need for a long time, but they're not meeting the need. And a lot of the nonprofits have gotten out of the loan closet business um, and it has been sped up by COVID. The beauty of this program is the coordination between the nonprofits and, and uh, the DME reuse program. And as Secretary Kramer very nicely explained about the sanitation and you know, ensuring that the equipment is safe to use, uh, that's a role that uh, allows this coordination to occur. Then there's unanticipated benefits. You know, we all think about unanticipated consequences, uh, but this was one that rolled the benefits. And so what were they? Well, we kept the equipment out of the landfill and those are costs, but the supply chain disruption, all the money in the world wouldn't have bought you <laughs> DME uh, when the supply chain was blocked. My neighbor, unfortunately, had a brain tumor. Uh, he uh, stayed an extra week in the ICU at BWMC because they couldn't find a hospital bed. Uh, so, you know, there are unanticipated un un benefits uh, uh, downstream. Finally, uh, there's the emotional piece. And I must say that when uh, uh, Bill's, two of his power wheelchairs, went to give a teenager with muscular dystrophy who was uninsured and uh, a, a, a homeless gentleman who was paraplegic mobility, it warmed my heart. So I, I urge you to support this program. I think that getting the word out is, uh, it takes a while. Uh, and so uh, give them time. And I think this thing's gonna pay off in the long run. I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have. 
Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Michelle Douglas. Thank you, Chairman Resnick and members of the subcommittee. Michelle Douglas on behalf of the Maryland Association of Area Agencies on Aging, we're known as M4A for short. M4A and its 19 associated area agencies on aging represent the front line in Maryland's challenge to meet the complex and varied needs of well over 1 million older adults statewide, and that number just continues to blossom. M4A serves Maryland's older and disabled citizens, providing a range of cost-effective state, federal, and locally funded programs that help individuals remain secure in the community with dignity, independence, and choice as they age the way we all want to. It is always M4A's mission to ensure the safety and well-being of older and disabled adults, including throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. This past year continued to be altered by that pandemic. And M4A thanks the governor for the additional ARPA funding over the past year. It has helped enable uh, the network to adjust and to adapt some of its most critical needs, including providing mass vac vaccination services. We also applaud the governor for including additional funds in the proposed budget before you for several of our most vital programs and offer its full support for these increases. The 20% increase in funding for senior care, senior assisted living subsidy, and congregate housing will allow the AAAs, Area Agencies on Aging, to reduce their waiting list, um, provide more services to people in these much needed state programs, or a mix of both, depending on the specific need by the local. M4A also supports the additional $3 million increase for the Information and Assistance Program. Um, as the secretary noted, the AAAs uh, and the secretary uh, at the department worked very closely last week to pull together um, information for the report requested um, by the analyst who did a wonderful job, by the way. And um, so we urge the timely release of these funds at the beginning of the year. INA funding will be designated to hire staff, increase outreach, and be used as a federal match for the Maryland Access Point to increase billable service hours. That's the federal match. And for a strong commitment to provide such valuable and cost-effective services to the vulnerable older populations of this state remains steadfast, and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the witness panel? Seeing none, thank you all very much. We're now gonna move on to the administrative budget for the Department of Human Services. We'll start with the analyst and then move on to uh, the department. So we will now call on, um, oops, wrong one. There it is, nope, that's not it. There it is. <laughs> Grace, it's you again. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's my pleasure to present the Department of Human Services Fiscal 20, um, Administration Unit uh, Fiscal 2023 Budget Analysis. Um, looking at the first exhibit, the budget decreases 17 million, and this is uh, mostly driven by various IT expenditures. Um, one notable thing here is that um, general funds are slightly reduced for the Maryland Lead the Maryland Legal Services Program, which uh, is able to capture a Title IV-E match for the first time um, in a couple of years, the department is including that in the budget. Um, this was, um, they were able to receive, um, they used federal funds for this purpose uh, prior to fiscal 2017. Uh, before I get into too much of the budget discussion, I'm gonna uh, start with a performance analysis. And uh, each year the department submits uh, data about its, uh, the proportion of children in out of home case, um, out of home placements that receive appropriate services. So, Exhibit One is showing the proportion of cases that receive appropriate educational services in red, appropriate um, physical and mental health services in yellow, and then the proportion of um, cases that were reported to the local departments of social services and courts within um, a fifteen day period. And um, as you can see in 21, there was um, a substantial reduction in the, um, the timely reporting of cases. So uh, DLS recommends agency comment on how they plan to resume pre-fiscal 21 um, 
timely reporting, as well as how they plan to improve the, uh, the proportion of cases that receive appropriate educational and um, physical and mental health services. Going to the budget discussion, starting in fiscal 22, there's a proposed efficiency for the MD Think project. The federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services requested the department um, create a more streamlined uh, Medicaid application. So um, this deficiency will support that work. And then uh, moving to the fiscal 23 discussion, about half of the budget supports the um, Office of Technology for Human Services with the next largest chunk being for personnel. The specific fluctuations in the budget from fiscal 22 to 2023 20, uh, are mostly for IT expenditures, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, looking down here at the bottom of that section, um, costs associated with um, application hosting and maintenance decrease over 23 million, and that's mostly driven by um, phasing out the legacy human services system. The um, MD Think major IT project proposes to um, Re replace um, the legacy human services systems with new systems and then integrate them in onto a shared platform. So um, there's a um, expected reduction in costs associated with maintaining those legacy systems in fiscal 2022. Um, going to personnel, the um, vacancy rate decreases slightly from a little over 7% to um, a little less than five and a half percent. And um, this reduction is notable, uh, especially as the department's um, vacancies currently doubled the, the proposed um, vacancy rate. Um, there's, they would need um, 41 positions to accommodate the, the 5.4 percent vacancy rate, um, turnover rate, and then um, currently vacancies exceed uh, 90 in, just within the DHS administration unit. Um, the issue one looks at department-wide vacancies, um, which are higher. Um, in exhibit four, uh, this exhibit looks at the, um, the proportion of positions that are filled. And um, as of January 1st, uh, 2022, the proportion filled um, is uh, relatively low considering um, the proportion of positions filled um, over the prior 10 years. Um, then looking at the distribution of um, vacancies department-wide, uh, the Family Investment Administration and the Social Services Administration consistently comprise over 70% of the department's um, vacancies. And as of January, there were um, over 880 vacancies department-wide. Looking at Exhibit 6, uh, each administration uh, saw at least 80 per, 86% of positions filled, except for the Family Admi um, Investment Administration that has almost one in five positions vacant. Um, looking at the, um, the positions that are persistently vacant, so this, um, this table compiles all the um, positions that saw at least um, two or more years with a vacancy rate in excess of the, the budgeted turnover rate. And, you can see in this exhibit that a lot of these positions have relatively low compensation with um, the minimum salary starting um, at less than $40,000. And the exception to this are social worker positions um, that although they have higher compensation frequently join um, the, the other classes of positions that have that see these persistent vacancies. So um, given that their compensation is relatively higher. There could be other explanations for um, the difficulty in um, retention in those positions. And one of which could be um, burnout, especially during pandemic months when their, their roles were especially uh, challenging. And several academic studies have look in, looked into social worker burnout during the pandemic and noted the importance of supporting their mental health needs and um, peer support of social workers um, throughout pandemic months. So, um, DLS is asking the agency to comment on um, how it's prioritized the well-being of social workers during the pandemic and any sorts of peer support or um, flexibilities that have been available to those employees. Um, looking at um, the family investment um, specialist, this is also a uh, class of physicians that sees persistently high vacancy rates. Um, so um, family investment specialists serve um, Maryland families at their um, 
the point of entry to assistance for ver various family investment programs. And um, with um, in this position, these uh, these employees are required to have a, a minimum of a bachelor's degree, but the, the the department is currently working with DBM to adjust the um, the requirements for this position. Uh, so to remove the, the bachelor's degree requirement. So uh, DLS is asking DHS to comment whether they expect to see any um, changes in service provision or supervisory needs with that, um, that change in educational requirements. And um, another note about this vacancy rate being so um, historically low considering um, previous year's experience is that during the pandemic, the department was likely better um, positioned to accommodate that lower rate of um, positions filled because um, as maltreatment reports declined during the pandemic, um, the child welfare um, caseload declined and as well there, as there has been um, te temporary flexibilities for various family investment programs like um, recertifications were paused for a while and um, so were interviews which um, decreased the workload so um, as these temporary flexibilities expire and the child welfare caseload is likely to increase with the return to in-person school um, they, there could be effects on service provision if the uh, the current vacancy rate it remains at um at the current level um, so DLS is recommending to request a report on DHS's recruitment plan and um, the impact of vacancy rates on service delivery. Moving to the second issue, uh, this is about the MD Think major IT project, which is planned to conclude in fiscal 2022. And then um, the shared platform will be in the maintenance and operations phase in um, fiscal 23. So exhibit eight um, shows the uh, status of each major uh, human services system. And um, notably the child support management system is in development in fiscal 22, but the department expects to uh, deploy the, the new system statewide by uh, the fourth quarter of the current fiscal year, as well as decommission the uh, legacy system inside that same quarter. Um, so um, another, Update here is that the uh, department is projecting to spend about um, 8 million less general funds than it is uh, received in funding. So those um, surplus general funds are expected to remain in the major IT fund um, in do it. Um, going to the recommendations, um, the first one is annual language restricting um, funding for the Maryland Legal Services Program to that purpose. Uh, the second recommendation is um, about that department-wide recruitment plan that I mentioned earlier. And then the, the third uh, recommendation is to request a catalog of available data reports that will um, be available um, with the the implementation of the MD Think program. One of the major benefits of the major IT project was um, improved data collection and reporting capabilities. So this requests um, information about all the different types of reports that will be available with the new system, as well as um, request the department to uh, describe any reporting issues that are experienced at the time this report would be submitted. So that concludes my presentation and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Grace. Uh, any questions for the analyst? All right, seeing none, let's move to the department. We have um, Secretary Padilla and her team. Please go ahead and introduce your team for us. Thank you, Chairman Resnick and members of the committee for the opportunity to discuss the FY 2023 budget allowance for DHS administration. I have my team here with me today, Gregory Jim, James, Deputy Secretary for Operations. In the back, Subramanian Muniasimi Subi, Chief Technology Officer, and Stafford Chipongo, Chief Financial Officer. I also have um, available to answer questions as necessary, our Director for Human Resources Development and Training, Daniel Waite. Denise Conway, Executive Director for Social Service Administration, and Nashira Ayala, Executive Director, Family Investment Administration. I want to take the time to thank Grace Pedersen for her comprehensive and concise analysis. She's a pleasure to work with, and we appreciate all her support. You have my written testimony, so I will only take a moment to comment on DHS administration. 
during the departmental overview and budget hearing, I testify about the mission of the department and the work and accomplishment of our programs. All of the department's vital work is supported and made possible by the administration units and the budget you're hearing here today. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, despite teleworking and other challenges, DHS continued to deliver critical services to protect vulnerable children and adults and assist families and individuals in economic distress. Our phone line and program staff are some of the many heroes of the pandemic. Today, I especially want to acknowledge and thank all of the DHS administration workers for their dedication on hard work. In particular, all that they did to ensure that all DHS staff had the tools and resources necessary to work effectively from home or safely in the office throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Without them, our work would not have been possible. They are also heroes. Now, with your permission, I will move directly to the recommended actions and issues in the analysis. The DLS analysis contains three recommended actions. The department concurs with the recommendations. Turning now to the five issues for discussion, is response to issue one regarding the reason for the decline in timely reporting and steps were taken to resume pre fiscal 2021 report timelessness. The department agrees with the importance of returning to pre fiscal 2021 reporting timelessness and ensuring youth in foster care receive timely educational, physical, and mental health services. During the pandemic, it has been difficult to coordinate and schedule the necessary meetings and activities with families and external partners for children and youth who have an existing or were in need of a new individual education plan, I, yes, we know, so that they would receive timely services. The pandemic also limited the availability of in-person visits and scheduling with healthcare providers within the mandated timeframes. The department is taking action so that we return to pre-fiscal 2021 reporting levels. We have a new child welfare medical director who joined in January this year. We have established a new SSA audit and compliance quality implementation unit. We constantly reiterate to caseworkers importance of maintaining up-to-date educational, physical, and mental health services to children in our care. Additionally, the department will continue to enhance CTM's reports and the ability to share information with MSDE and MDH. In response to issue two, commenting on efforts to prioritize the well-being of social workers during the pandemic, first, I want to say that prioritizing the well-being of social workers during the pandemic and at all times is critical to maintaining staff morale. And it is the right thing to do. Support begins with building communication between supervisors and their teams to ensure the flow of communication. We have made the commitment that all staff have the tools necessary to succeed. It has included distributing laptop computers, iPads, and cellular telephones to staff and supervisors, and providing staff training developed by the department's learning office, which focuses on helping supervisory staff understand the role as a coach and mentor. We also partner with the Maryland Institute of Emergency Medical Services Systems to provide peer support for mental health. Staff also have access to my MD Cares program, which provides state employees access to counselors on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In addition, many local departments of social services have developed quiet spaces within their offices to allow workers time to decompress and process the stresses of the job. The expansion of telework also allow many workers greater flexibility or able to adjust their schedule and work more efficiently. 
the department continues to explore additional options to provide support. In response to issue three, regarding the impact that changes to FIA entry-level positions requirements are expected to have on service provisions for supervisor needs, the department took a number of actions to increase worker efficiency, which minimized the impact on vacancies on FIA clients. To increase hiring, the department is expanding entry-level opportunities. The department does not anticipate any negative impact on service provisions or provision requirements due to this change. In response to issue four, regarding the DHS recruitment plan and the impact of department wide vacancy rates on service delivery, the department concurs with the analyst recommendation we will provide a report on a recruitment plan and the impact on department wide vacancy rates on services delivery. In response to issue five, regarding <coughs> data reporting for the EIE, EIE, and CGMS application, the department takes data reporting very seriously. The data reporting issues are common with any major IT transition and do not reflect a problem with the underlying technology or system. As issues are identified, they're being addressed and resolved, and we're working hard to have them addressed this school year. This concludes my testimony and response, and I will be happy to address any questions the committee may have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee or the department? Delegate Henson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Secretary Padilla, for your response to each, um, each point of the analysis and for an overview of some highlights from the department. Looking at the vacancy rates and the chart that's there, I'm wondering, I know that we get the budget and it's this intact proposal, but I know on your end, you all have a completely you know, different process where you're evaluating things and putting together proposals that go to the governor. Have we done any sort of recent classification and comp um, compensation study to justify the salaries that we have there for some of these positions? And if so, are you advocating for something different on your end that we're just not privy to, or I want to understand that better? I'm going to have um, my human resource director comment on, on, your, on your questions and the studies that have been completed um, by with 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 collaboration um, Department of Budget and Management. Mr. Wade, would you please? Yes. Thank you so much, Delegate Hudson. I appreciate having the opportunity to answer this question. Uh, my name is Dan Wade, and I am the Director of Human Resources here at the Department of Human Services. Um, the department uh, consistently advocates for our staff and uh, the looking at compensation levels for our staff to uh, try to ensure that they are meeting the needs of our uh, staffing vacancies, our staffing recruitment efforts, and our retention efforts. Um, we have, in prior years, submitted uh, a request for ASRs uh, for various positions. But a year ago, or it might have been in uh, fiscal yeah, in fiscal 21 or 20, our social worker series received a, an annual salary review increase of a one pay grade uh, addition to their compensation. So yes, we do those types of analysis and we do consistently advocate on behalf of our staff. I appreciate the response there. Looking at family investment, um, one of the positions, the entry level family investment, it looks like it's currently at 61% for the vacancy rate. Um, when a position is, is so underutilized like that, do you look at if there's perhaps an appropriate way to start people at the next pay level and maybe that position just has um, is not competitive or attractive for whatever reason? And um, thank you. Very good question, um, Delegate. And what one of the reasons why we are proposing the change in um, the entry level requirements, education um, um, factors, is, is because we want to address the vacancy rate, as you stated, it's very high. 
it has been difficult throughout the years for us to fill that position. I'm going to have the HR director elaborate a little bit more even on the efforts that we're doing in that series. Mr. Wade. So again, um, Delia Hanson, thank you. Um, this is a topic that I could talk at length on, but I will be as brief as possible. Um, yeah, the department recognizes that the Family Investment Specialist Series uh, has uh, changed fundamentally as the post-pandemic landscape and the post-pandemic labor market has changed. And in order to address that, um, we are looking at different ways of uh, looking at that position. As we do that analysis, there are some guiding principles that we have. Number one, we want to be able to fill our vacancies. Number two, and maybe probably more important than number one, we want to ensure the quality of service is maintained at all times. And number three, we do want to make sure that the work environment is being enhanced. Um, at the same time, we looked at our departmental mission and realized that there are some consistencies with our departmental mission in ways that we can address this problem by removing barriers to entry uh, and by giving more access to these positions to Maryland working families. So what we are seeking to do at this time is remove the college degree requirement from the family investment uh, specialist position uh, we are aware that there is a very deep reserve of untapped talent uh, in folks coming out of high school who choose not to go on to have college education or who don't have access to it. So we feel that by making this change in the job spec, not only can we fill our positions, retain people longer, but we can also meet our missions to underserved communities uh, to give them more access to these opportunities that have stable hours, uh, good steady wages, and outstanding benefits. Um, so one other thing I do want to address very quickly is when you look at the vacancy rates in the family investment series and the family investment one specifically, it should be understood that when we recruit for these positions, that is our entry level. So oftentimes what happens is somebody who is at a, a family investment two or family investment three, if they leave the department, that position is downgraded back to the family investment one for recruitment purposes. So you would naturally see a higher vacancy rate in that family investment one series. Madam Secretary, thank you, Mr. Wade, for undergoing that analysis. And it looks like taking some um, thoughtful approaches to figuring out how we help with the entry level positions and what's appropriate in terms of salary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate Valentino Smith. Thank you. So, just continuing in that area of family investment on page 13. Um, obviously, it's very concerning that you foreshadow for us there that um, because the caseloads um, workload was decreased because during the pandemic, there was the temporary suspension of having to do the recertifications and the interviews, but that starting this January, new applicants are required to be interviewed and recipients of benefits are again required to recertify their eligibility. And these are our most vulnerable people trying to recertify, trying to do the in-person, maybe not even having computer and broadband access and you not having the number of employees you need, it does say that it's gonna impact service delivery to our most vulnerable. So are you immediately re re, uh, doing something, working with the governor's office, sending up a 911, doing something to make sure that you're going to have what you need to recertify everybody and do the personal interviews or risk them losing their benefits? Or is there some waiver you can tell the federal government um, that you can't do or ask the governor to do the limited emergency 
um, for this population, which is what we asked him to do before. Thank you, um, Delegate Valentina Smith. Um, very good question. And most importantly, I want to thank you for um, always your interest in um, and vulnerable, fa vulnerable families. I want to say that um, I'm, I'm very proud of saying that um, benefit delivery has not been impacted at all. As a matter of fact, um, um, and we, we have um, testified a number of times on our timelessness, ability to um, provide timely benefits. And we have put um, an action plan, strategic plan in place that, that allows us to continue uh, providing benefits and um, timely redetermination of benefits um, with the staff that, that we have in place. Needless to say, um, the vacancy, as you stated, um, needs to be addressed. And in doing so, um, when we completed the, the analysis and we were in the planning process for um, the redetermination and, and the other waivers, waivers to, that were um, expiring, um, we, we did um, submit a request for um, contractual in, um, positions that were immediately approved by the governor's office so we could um, bring staff quicker while we continue to focus on filling the, the vacancies in the um, FTEs um, the state um, positions. So both things are have taken place at the same time. We brought contractual positions and continue to do so. At the same time, we, we continue to focus on bringing employees to a state, a state pits. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. And again, too, I commend you. I know your commitment to these vulnerable families and a shared concern that we have that they might not be able to do their eligibility um, now that the emergency is over and the new recertification requirements are in place and not wanting them to, to lose even a month of food or TCA. So thank you. I'm glad the contractual provisions con employees will be there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, uh, we do not have any, uh, any witnesses signed up to testify on this budget. So that, thank you, Madam Secretary and your team. And we are now gonna move on to the administration budget for the Department of Health and Andrew Garrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And good afternoon, members of the subcommittee. Uh, in front of you all today, you should be seeing the uh, budget for the uh, Maryland Department of Health Administration. And uh, we actually have a pretty flat budget here, um, but we do have some changes in the general fund uh, and special fund expenditures. Uh, the general fund's actually increasing with some impact of, um, of various salary enhancements that we'll be talking about later on. And the reduction in special fund is due to the uh, opioid restitution fund being over budgeted in 22 and that being corrected in 23. Uh, the, calling this the administration budget is um, a bit of a misnomer because now it actually does also include all of the state uh, health facilities. So all the regional BHA facilities, Perkins, uh, the all three DDA hospitals are now considered in here as well. Um, and then also the chronic care facilities, so we have two of those. And so um, what we want to do here with all these uh, considered in this budget is have them uh, look at the safety of them. So on exhibit one, we have a resident on staff assaults measure, and this measure is actually reported consistently uh, between the DDA facilities uh, and those BHA facilities. And so we've plotted them here for you um, and drew a line as to what the department's goal is in terms of the number of resident on staff assaults on sort of a per patient hour basis. We see that the DDA facilities have a broadly a lower rate. Uh, that's the SET unit, the Holly Center, and the Potomac Center. Uh, with Perkins having the largest number of staff assaults, but um, on a rate basis, I guess being fairly consistent with the bed hours. This is something we wanted to do with the patient safety side of these. Um, however, those measures are reported differently between the two facilities. Uh, one focuses just on patient, on patient assaults, and the other one considers a patient injury rate. So DLS has a recommendation here around committee narrative, uh, requesting a report about um, having the department really look at what are the best measures for patient and staff safety, and then having those recommendations for uh, what's the best way to look at that uh, be incorporated into future managing for results. 
The other uh, aspect we want to highlight here in this budget, uh, before we get into the dollars, is the uh, uh, the role that this has with court order placements in the health department. And so the court order placements uh, are those individuals who are uh, either not criminally responsible or NCR uh, or incompetent to stand trial, the ISTs. And uh, there was legislation uh, passed uh, in 2018 uh, that required the health department to put those court order placements uh, in a in a state that um, within 10 days. And the the data that we have suggests that they were able to do that in uh, fiscal 2019, the first year under that mandate. However, the average time uh, of those placements, as well as the number of folks who are getting admitted within business days, um, and within those 10 days has been taking longer uh, in 2020 and 2021. And so with that in mind, um, you know, knowing that uh, they have been able to meet that legislative mandate in recent years, DLS also has a recommendation uh, restricting funding pending a report uh, on the placement of those quarter folks and how uh, the hospital system is going to be able to meet those legislative mandates. Uh, jumping ahead into the budget section, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of this budget is actually pertained to the state hospitals. Uh, so we see two thirds of the dollars that we have here is for state employees and their compensation and their compensation, uh, with another 15% going to the day to day operations of those health facilities. Uh, and so the part that would traditionally look like administration is really only 20% of the dollars that we have here. Uh, and we focus on that in exhibit six um, of those uh, other administrative offices. So included in this budget, in addition to all of our state health facilities, um, are the uh, shared services. So uh, accounting, human resources, procurement are all budgeted here, kind of the, the main offices from headquarters, uh, executive direction. So the secretary's office is here as well, of course. And then we also do a few separate uh, offices. The Inspector General for Health is budgeted separately, um, but we're still considering him uh, and that office uh, here, as well as the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Looking at the uh, change in the budget, um, we are starting to see the impact of uh, chapters 572 and 576 of 2020. Uh, this is legislation that pertain to compensation at, at those hospitals. And because we do have most of the hospitals here, we are seeing those impacts. Uh, we have dollars in both fiscal 22 and then carrying on into fiscal 23 around that. Um, and that does make up the largest change. And we do see most of our changes in the personnel um, aspect. The other thing I did want to highlight is uh, down at the bottom of the screen there, the opioid restitution fund. When those dollars came in, they were budgeted at uh, $12 million, which was the amount available through the McKinsey settlement. Uh, and the HS since reported that they certainly won't be spending all of that uh, in the fiscal 2022 uh, year. And uh, the current appropriation uh, more closely reflects what the actual expenditures are going to be. Um, and we would still expect some funding to re remain in the opioid restitution fund um, uh, beyond uh, fiscal 22 and 23 uh, for those purposes. So uh, discussing the compensation increases uh, that, again, drives a lot of the spending and a lot of the dollars here, uh, we've pulled out a couple different impacts that we have here for the, um, the administration budget. First, uh, we have about a three and a half million dollar impact uh, of those uh, pieces of legislation that I mentioned earlier. Additionally, the department has uh, had a fiscal 2022 deficiency for overtime, of course, again, largely focusing on safe facilities. And then we are starting to see, again, a regular earnings increase, which is also related to that legislative action take effect in fiscal 23. Um, that includes a, uh, some sort of grade increases that were mandated as part of those legislation. And then uh, it's not yet reflecting the budget, but we think it is important to also note that there are those fiscal 23 statewide salary actions. Right now, those are still in the statewide personnel account. Um, but all in all, we would expect about $32.6 million to come into this budget for those purposes for our uh, state health employees. In particular, I wanted to look at the, um, the distribution of that legislation um, and how it is shared throughout the, uh, the hospitals that we have here. As you all know, this pertained to the uh, forensic uh, rate and the forensic population uh, in facilities, as well as also increasing the, staff, um, the compensation for staff at Perkins in particular. So what we've done is we've plotted the um, percent of that impact of those increases uh, relative to the, the total regular earnings at that facility. Uh, and again, we see kind of where that is concentrated with Perkins uh, receiving the largest from a share standpoint, um, but then also SETS and some of the other larger regionals um, receiving uh, a substantial amount of funding as well um, uh, for this purpose in, in accordance with that legislation. The other uh, impact that we noted was overtime expenditures. Uh, DLS has actually uh, 
routinely pointed out that overtime has been under budgeted. And so the fiscal 22 deficiency uh, level brings that funding up to a level that we're consistently more used to, to seeing and anticipating within this budget. And then that also continues into fiscal 23. I mean, so we think that's really important to highlight um, that we believe that the 22 uh, working with the deficiency more closely reflects what we would expect expenditures to be. And we're happy to see that continue into 23 as well. Uh, the other item of note um, is we do have some uh, position changes. Broadly speaking, the department did not eliminate any positions this year. Some folks were moved around, um, but the net loss, uh, a net loss of positions did occur to these facilities. Uh, it's about a 13 and a half total position reduction. And I've plotted out where those reductions occurred throughout the, the hospitals in particular, um, with Spring Grove and Perkins losing the most um, on a sort of rate basis. But again, this no position necessarily deleted, um, but they were moved away from, from those particular facilities. And then the another item on the personnel front is vacancies, uh, which we plot here as well. Uh, and on Exhibit 12 in particular, I'd like to put a pin in the fact that uh, some of the facilities with the highest vacancy rate are those at our DDA facilities. Um, and that's going to be important when we talk about the uh, first issue of the analysis, uh, where we really wanted to look at what the um, the current composition is of, uh, of our state employees at these hospitals. Um, and so on exhibit 13, uh, you guys might recall in the uh, health department overview, we took a snapshot of the health department employee cohort. And so here's using that same data set, but really just focusing on the folks who are budgeted uh, within the administration budget. And we looked at uh, what their hire date was. Um, and we've put, we've plotted that uh, on, you, uh, on exhibit 13 here. And we're showing that on balance, you can kind of see that the, uh, the folks who are working at our facilities are a little bit less tenured than those folks uh, who are with us uh, through the administrative functions of this budget. Uh, and you know, in particular, see the um, uh, employees who are perhaps hired you know, around like the aughts to late 90s uh, being more prevalent for the administrative role of this budget. And then what we did is we looked at this cohort and we had the employee identification numbers and if they transferred, sometimes that was denoted in the data. And so we tried to compare that to uh, this same snapshot of data from 2020 to see uh, who perhaps left state service or left the department during the pandemic. And then from there, we were able to plot that with um, specific facilities that that pin was associated with. And the um, and if so, what, what we're showing here is if a, a position was no longer on the report, uh, that was there in 2020 was no longer there in 2022. We're kind of calling that a quit. Uh, we understand that you know there's a lot of different reasons someone may have left service, um, but as a shorthand, that was kind of the what we use as a unit for this analysis. And um, as I mentioned a, a little bit ago, we saw that the the DDA facilities had the highest um, vacancy rate at present, and that's consistent with what we saw in this analysis, where the DDA hospitals have the highest quits rate, particularly among. Um, those healthcare professionals, so those staff uh, working in healthcare roles at our DDA facilities. Um, they also had the highest rate in the public safety positions that we have associated with the budgets. Um, but in general, you do see broadly that uh, folks at the hospitals had a bit of higher, higher quit rate than some of the folks in administrative positions. And so using that same uh, analysis, then looking at who quits, uh, what, what those total numbers of folks who left the department was during the pandemic, uh, we see that it was um, the, the folks in particular leaving the facilities uh, were disproportionately newer staff than, than those who left from the administrative side of things. So what that seems to really point to is a retention issue. Uh, if you look at right about 50% of that cumulative percent, um, half of the folks who left a facility position during the pandemic uh, were only with the state for five years or fewer. Whereas if you continue out that 50% line, uh, the it would be closer to 10 years for folks on the administrative side. So a lot more, a lot less tenured individuals ended up leaving the department from the facilities, again, really pointing to perhaps challenges with retention in particular. And this is something that um, the legislature has been interested in um, for several years now. Um, in, in particular, there was actually a request uh, for a, a JCR report last year and funding was withheld from that that is yet to be submitted. And so we have um, a pair of recommendations here around um, in particular, looking at employee recruitment and retention at our state health facilities. Part of it does reiterate that prior request that, um, that, that the legislature had made, but
but also to look at the impacts of the new legislation and of those salary enhancements and how that has helped with recruitment or retention uh, with our uh, facilities. And in addition, uh, we will spend more time talking about the facilities master plan when the capital budget's in front of you all. However, uh, we do think it's worth noting that the facilities master plan does talk about um, rearranging or perhaps reallocating some sort of uh, services being offered at the various facilities. Uh, and so we want the any reporting that's done by the department uh, to also consider um, the alignment of state employees with the facilities master plan and the future use of, of, of the health facilities. The other thing to highlight very quickly is this, this budget also contains a major IT project expenditures. Right now, the any general funds for a project in either fiscal 22 or fiscal 23 are in the state's major IT fund, but we do have the overall scope of projects that we're reflecting here in exhibit 16. And what we've seen is that broadly, uh, these visit, uh, the, the costs of these projects have been delayed and pushed out into out years. And with the exception of the cloud data center, uh, project costs have gone up on the major IT side of things. Uh, of course, the department has been experiencing their network security incident. Um, and we do talk briefly about uh, some of the impacts that that has had uh, on the workflow for the department staff. Uh, additionally, it's worth noting that this week, the Board of Public Works approved uh, $5.6 million in general fund expenditures uh, for replacing equipment um, to, to, uh, to assist with the um, response to the network security incident. Uh, but that ultimately does conclude my presentation. Again, we have recommendations around uh, court order placements and the um, the workforce uh, at the hospital, uh, at the state hospitals, and that concludes my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Andrew? Pat, uh, Delegate Young, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, good, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Andrew, thanks for the comprehensive piece, and uh, you sort of just mentioned this towards the end. I just wanted to confirm publicly. The, you mentioned the master plan, facilities master plan, and I'm not tying two together in terms of the folks who are leaving, but the master plan didn't really address much at all about personnel related to these facilities potentially either being moved, consolidated. It just mentioned the facilities and recommendations in the next 20, 30 years. Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Delegate. To the extent that there is uh, any discussion of personnel, uh, there is talks about opportunities of savings when it comes to transitioning services, but specifically about um, the, the same employees that are currently there, um, it's largely silent on that. No, no, and the report just came out, I can't imagine that they folks wanted to stick around knowing that the facility might be moved, closed, or consolidated. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions for the analyst? Okay, seeing none, let's move to the department. Uh, we have Secretary Schrader, and Mr. Secretary, I have a long list of folks, but um, looks like you're by yourself or have one, have one additional person with you. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Chair Resnick, uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, for the record, my name is Dennis Schrader, uh, Health Secretary. Uh, I wanna thank the governor and the budget committee's uh, support for our COVID-19 response efforts to date. And we thank uh, the Department of Legislative Services uh, and their budget analysis for uh, analysts for the comprehensive and insightful discussion. Uh, on a very specific note, before I turn it over to Deputy Secretary Atif Chowdhury, who's with me, uh, we released our uh, master facilities plan this past fall. The, the, this is a three phase, 20 year plan that aligns with the Department of Health's projected patient care needs uh, for healthcare services offered or provided by the department. Uh, it enables us to begin the process of divesting facilities that are no longer operating, uh, possibly using existing capacity that already exists in Maryland and to build new state-of-the-art facilities and properly plan so we can provide Marylanders the level of healthcare they deserve and expect today as well as today as well as into the future. Uh, phase one, which will occur from 2022 to 2026, entails divesting three closed facilities: uh, Crownsville Hospital Center in Anne Arundel County, uh, the Regional Institute for Children and Adolescents uh, in Southern Maryland in Prince George's County and the Upper Shore Community Mental Health Center in Kent County, 
Uh, and in addition, we're going to begin the planning for Spring Grove Hospital Center, which will uh, take a while. Uh, that won't be happening uh, in necessarily in the first phase. Uh, phase two is from 2027 to 2032 and is focused on constructing a new facility for children and a secure evaluation therapeutic treatment center for the central Maryland region and constructing a replacement patient building in the Springfield Hospital Center in Sykesville. And then the last phase uh, is projected to occur from 2032 to 2041 and is projected to include renovating the Holly Center in Salisbury, uh, integrating MDH facility patients with community providers and developing strategic partnerships to transition services currently provided at the Potomac Center and finalize, of course, the Spring Grove Hospital Center uh, for uh, healthcare and community providers. Our goal, though, through this ongoing process is to finalize a capital program. In order to get a capital program in place, you need it, we needed to have a master facilities plan. We've been working on this for the past uh, three years. Uh, it got slowed down a little bit because of COVID, but we managed to punch it through this uh, last summer and announced it in the fall uh, for the rejuvenation of our facilities. And it's, it's a, a planning document that evolves over this 20 years and it's intended to start the conversation uh, in a very public way so that, uh, you know, we, in meetings like this, we can begin the dialogue. So we're very excited about that opportunity. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, our Deputy Secretary Chief, Chief Chowdhury. Uh, we're happy to take questions after uh, he, uh, he's going to give a brief summary of our written response. And we also have our CFO, Emily Brandenburg, uh, Brian Moroz, the Director of our Health Facilities, and Will Andalaro and Webster Yee, as well as Nick Napolitano for questions as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Secretary Chowdhury. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, for the record, my name is Asif Chaudhry. I'm the Deputy Secretary for Operations uh, for MDH. I wanted to provide you with a quick overview of our responses, our written responses you have before you. With regard to the request for a report on patient and staff safety, uh, we concur with the DLS recommendation and uh, wanted to also reiterate uh, that the safety of patients and staff are our highest priority here at the department. With regard to the recommendation to restrict funds pending a report on placement of court-ordered IST and NCR admissions, uh, we respectfully disagree. We believe the analysis, this analysis should also be viewed in the bigger picture lens of reduced court operations, healthcare staffing shortages nationwide, and the need to protect patients and staff from COVID-19 outbreaks. We have been working closely with the judiciary over the past two years to carefully manage patient admissions and discharges. We have held steady at an average admission cycle time of 17 days for the vast majority of 2021 and 17 days for 2020. It's important to note that in 2021, we received over 150 more commitment orders than in 2020. In, in 2019, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the average admission cycle time was only eight days. If asked, we believe that the judiciary would agree with us that we are all working together to manage this situation and ensure that individuals receive appropriate clinical care. We have worked with the judiciary to help keep the courts open, including distributing over 250,000 KN95 masks and 99,000 point of care test kits to date. In addition, we are pleased to partner with the courts to station vaccine clinics at various courthouses for staff and visitors. In 2021, we opened two new inpatient psychiatric units for a total of 40 new beds and repurposed over 50 vacant merit positions to staff these new units. MDH typically discharges to step down placements in the community. These community providers also are dealing with very similar issues, uh, such as COVID-19 outbreaks and healthcare staffing shortages, which have resulted in a reduced number of beds. We are working closely with the MDH Behavioral Health Administration to ensure community provider capacity to provide lower level clinical acuity services 
so that we can discharge patients from MDH facilities. If, we're in, if we are unable to discharge patients into these community providers, we are unable to admit patients currently on the wait list. With regard to the recommendation to restrict funds pending a report on staffing at MDH facilities, we respectfully disagree. Healthcare staffing is a challenge nationwide, and any comparisons right now would lead to misleading conclusions. As directed by Chapters 572 and 576 of 2020, MDH has promoted existing staff and recruited new staff into the Security Attendant Classification Series to meet the required staffing ratios in the applicable MDH healthcare system facilities. We continue to recruit for these positions through various initiatives, including online postings and locally hosted job fairs. We have also implemented the three 12-hour schedules for the nursing staff as authorized by Chapter 327 of 2021. We have also, also offered COVID-19 response pay to direct care workers, and in fiscal year 23 allowance provides for a one-grade ASR increase for over 100 classifications of nursing positions. With regard to the impact of the facilities master plan, Secretary Schrader covered the big picture implications of the plan. For more information, please see our written response in the plan itself for additional details. The MDH facilities master plan is a planning document that will continue to evolve over the 20 years it covers. MDH will work with employees and unions to address any impact of the facilities master plan on employees. MDH will also ensure that the impact to staff is as minimal as possible. We've also developed a communication strategy for the facilities master plan. We are working closely to ensure that updates and next steps are communicated with staff and employees have the opportunity to ask questions about this long-term planning process. This concludes our overview of our written responses, uh, and we are happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much for that response. Um, I'm going to have to duck out at 5 o'clock for another meeting that should be very, very brief. Uh, the vice chair will take over. So if uh, the committee is okay, I'm going to go first because there is a question I'd like to ask of the secretary, um, and uh, and I want to have the time to do it. So, Mr. Secretary, um, this uh, question deals with your central accounting office. Um, uh, it has come to my attention that a number of uh, MDH grantees and other financial recipients um, have not been paid for upwards of six months. I have heard from several folks outside of the Medicaid program who have uh, been waiting on invoices to be paid since July. Um, they have outstanding invoices in every month. Uh, so the uh, the cyber attack, the, the ransomware attack, uh, though it may have slowed things down in December, does not um, answer why folks haven't been getting paid uh, since July. And um, and we are I might, it is now my understanding that we are somewhere in the realm of about 900 invoices that are still unpaid out of your department. So I would like to get a sense of why. Uh, this delay has taken place and what your timeline is for getting that backlog of invoices cleared and paid. Uh, it is my understanding that there are uh, healthcare providers who are taking out loans to meet payroll because they are not getting paid by the department on legitimately approved invoices. So if you can please address that, I would appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to turn uh, this over to our CFO, Emily Brandenburg, who uh, has uh, uh, some answers to those questions. Thank you, Secretary Schrader, and thank you for your question. Um, it's a, a little bit of a perfect storm where there was the, um, the accounting, our general accounting was short several positions. We have COVID, which is a significant volume of invoices and dollars spent, and then the network security incident. And so the things that you shared, yes, th there's been an issue. I'm happy to report, though, we are well on the other side. We've added additional resources. We've had additional help from across the staff. We are processing a significant higher volume of invoices than previously, and we anticipate having the backlog completed by the end of the month. Okay. And of those uh, providers that um, 
uh, that are have been waiting for months and months. You know, a, a, as a federal contractor, as uh, you, I think folks have heard me mention that I'm a, a in my real life I'm a federal contractor, and uh, there's a, a federal law that's a prompt pay act that requires invoices to be paid within 30 days or uh, interest fee and fees start to attach. Um, is there any recompense for the providers that are literally taking out loans to be able to keep their people employed while you all are dealing with the backlog? So we have, that has not come to this level at this point, but it's certainly something we can talk about on offline if you would like. Uh, I would, and I would have one follow-up question. Um, it is also my understanding that the $15 million that has been released to the adult medical day community as part of the COVID enhancement has still not been released. Um, so I wanted to get a timeline on that money as well. Certainly, we can follow up with you on that as well. That's being handled through our Medicaid um, department, but I can get you more information on that. That would be great. Uh, thank you. I would definitely want to follow up with that. Uh, with that, are there any other questions from the subcommittee? Okay, seeing none, uh, we do have people signed up to testify. Uh, and just in time, I still have a few minutes left before my other meeting that I have to jump to. So we are going to call on, uh, there are five people signed up to testify. Uh, I'm going to read out their names and I don't know if the vice chair has the list. Do you have the list? No. Okay. So we're going to have committee staff help out um, and we will call in the following order. Um, Denise Gilmore, Scott Hainkamp, Peter Apoku, Carrie Elliott, and Quincy Quine Cooper. So uh, we'll start with you, Ms. Gilmore, and then um, I don't know if all of these folks are with you. Are they all with you? Uh, everyone except uh, Mr. Scott Hannikamp. He wasn't able to get to get on today. Okay, so um, why don't we do this? Why don't, because I do have to jump in seven minutes before I come back. Uh, why don't you go ahead and give us your presentation? And then if you can point to your folks and have them speak, that would be great uh, for the sake. And I know all of you have been waiting for a very long time, so I appreciate your patience. But for the sake of committee, if we could keep the comments to two to three minutes each so that um, so that we have time for everyone. And Ms. Gilmore, please take it away. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Denise Gilmore. I'm a field director with AFSCME Council 3. Uh, we represent the employees who work in our 12 MDH facilities statewide. They do incredible work every day restoring some of Maryland's most vulnerable individuals to a place where they can safely enter our communities again. And uh, across all facilities, they provide tremendous care to patients and residents they are charged with taking care of. Um, as we do have uh, three members signed up to testify, I, I promise I will keep things short, um, but I do want to lift up three concerns. Uh, the first is that, um, you know, right now the state is currently investing more in bed capacity for treating addictions and mental health in DOC than they are in the health department. I mean, if you just look at where the capital funding is going, uh, there are plans to currently uh, build an 800 bed treatment facility in the Division of Corrections in Baltimore City. Meanwhile, as has been referenced, MDH has announced this uh, 2041 facility master plan um, that uh, while it says transition services out really is just another way of saying they plan on privatizing uh, half of the MDH facilities through this plan over the next 20 years. Um, these weren't mentioned as part of the first play, uh, phase uh, uh, that were you know, brought up earlier, but we're particularly concerned uh, that uh, in this first phase, uh, it includes the closure of two chronic hospitals, uh, Western Maryland Hospital Center and Deershead uh, Hospital Center. That's despite um, you know, the community's wishes there, those facilities have been caring for and re rehabilitating Marylanders in, in Hagerstown and Salisbury respectively for over 60 years. Uh, we certainly feel that Maryland needs more public inpatient bed capacity and, and not less. We also want to lift up that uh, you know, part of the investment should also come in holding MDH accountable to meeting the security personnel to patient ratios uh, that were passed two years ago as, as part of uh, chapter you know, 576. Um, by our estimates, MDH still needs between 130 to 160 security attendants to meet that ratio. 
I know it was referenced earlier that they're doing, you know, this recruiting for security attendants. I, I just looked at the state jobs website. There's currently one active position for a security attendant, and that's to work at the Rika Baltimore, a facility that they have themselves have said, uh, you know, they don't even know, you know, if it is forensic. So, you know, again, we certainly understand that healthcare shortage shortages are a national issue, but the issues in our MDH facilities have been mounting for years. Um, we're happy to see continued investments in enhancing, you know, wages for our members who, who do this tough work, but we do think improving working conditions is also crucial for uh, retention. We can do this by adding more professionally trained security staff uh, to make our facilities safer. Uh, we also can do more to recruit and pr provide pipelines for these jobs. Four years ago, Springfield Hospital had 20 psychologists. That's enough for one in every unit at the psych facility. Today, they are down to four psychologists after vacant pins have been you know, downgraded and, and not filled. Uh, we think they can do more. They can expand the direct care trainee program. They can expand the psychologist intern program. We could look at exploring the vesting time back down to five years from 10 years. Uh, either way, um, you know, we're incredibly uh, proud to represent the women and men who work in these MDH facilities. They certainly have been, you know, frontline on this pandemic, and and we certainly think we can do a lot more to uh, invest in this high level and, and great patient quality care. Um, you know, certainly over privatizing it. So, uh, with that, we, we appreciate your time. I'd like to hand it over to Carrie Elliott uh, first. Good, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and subcommittee members. Um, my name is Carrie Elliott and I work at Deer's Head Hospital Center in Salisbury, Maryland as a geriatric nursing assistant. In September of 2021, Governor Hogan proposed a master plan that would close two of the state's long-term care facilities in the next five years. They are Deer's Head Hospital Center and Western Maryland Hospital Center. Each of these facilities have provided excellent care during this pandemic. At Deer's Head Hospital, we were able to contain the virus to only 11 residents on one floor with only one person being hospitalized. eyes and all are now symptom-free and recovering very well. And since our residents are vulnerable, I believe that the state should invest more time and money in long-term long care. Also, our state's general population is getting older and are in need of public services that the state provides. Putting the residents into a privately owned facility would cost the state even more money since since most are that are in the state facilities are on Medicare or on Medicaid. Deer's Head Hospital is also the only facility that has rooms to treat tuberculosis on the Eastern Shore. Deer's Head Hospital doesn't only call, care for local residents, but also houses an extensional community service called Coastal Hospice. So not only will closing Deer's Head Hospital hurt the facility's residents that are in need, but will also hurt the entire community. How could anyone look at a grieving family and tell them that there is no, no facility available to take care of their dying loved one? This means that they would have to take, take them home to care for them. Not many families on the Eastern Shore have the support or means to care for the needs of the person. I know firsthand how hard it is to place someone you love in a private, privately owned facility. I have to make sure my mom is being cared for like she was at home with my brother and myself. Private sector facilities do not care about their staff or residents like a state facility does. There are times that a privately owned facility will have one nursing aide to 40 residents whereas the state facility would have one aide to five or six residents, giving the best care possible to each resident. It only goes to show that privately owned facilities only care about their bottom dollar line. In closing, I suggest the state can reconsider the closing of these facilities and actually put more money into either updating the facility or in the case of Deer's Head Hospital, which is 71 years old, building a new state-of-the-art building that would help serve the community better. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Elliott. Ms. Gilmore, you're next. Oh, thanks. And if we could have Quinn A. Cooper next, please. I know you've got to run. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank good you. Afternoon. And if you can, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ms. Cooper, for waiting all day and maybe try to hold your testimony to about two minutes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for your time. My name is Quinnae Cooper and I'm a spring, I work for Spring Grove, which I've worked for five years. I'm a security attendant. Currently at Spring Grove, we have 392 patients on 15 different units. Our patients are considered minimum security. According to the forensic pay, we should be one security attendant for every 12 patients. And doing the math, on any given day or shift, we should have 33 security attendants on duty, excluding management. We currently have 75 security attendants on staff at Spring Grove. The majority of the officers are still holding contractual pens positions. We have 21 merit officers. We have 54 contractual officers. In a 24 hour period, we need 99 security attendants. So security attendants should be uh, merit considering they're working on forensic mental health facilities. There are assaults as well as numerous false accusations. There is no job security for a contractual worker. We need your help and support in getting pins to ensure we provide the safe environment possible for staff, patients, visitors, and the community alike. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, Ms. Cooper, and we do appreciate you, you waiting today. Ms. Gilmore, why don't you continue with your panel, and then I'll check with the rest of the committee members to see if they have any questions. Sure. Our, our last member speaking today is uh, President Peter Opoku from Local 266. Go ahead. You have to unmute. Just hit the space bar or unmute. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, giving me audience. My name is Peter Opoku. I'm a psych tech at Spring Grove Hospital Center. I've been there for about 17 years. Um, the problems we have in Spring Grove, perhaps other facilities have it the same way too. We have poor roads in the facility. The network of uh, streets are all broken. In 2019, October of 2019, I got into a, 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 a pothole and hit my car on the curb and ended up spending $650 repairing both the rim and the tire. We also respond to codes. So when there is a code, we got to rush out and take our own cars and run to the place where the code is. And with those bad roads, we end up going to the mechanic the next few days. It has happened many times to me and others. So we just want to call on the budget committee to perhaps uh, come to our aid because we believe that with the present economic situation, our management cannot afford out of the budget of the hospital. So we need a special budget to help restore the roads in Spring Road, both for the safety of staff and for patients as well, because when there's a code and you can't get there because your car broke on the way, it's gonna be uh, a serious situation. And we don't have less than, uh, I would say eight codes per day. So we, we go for codes a lot. So we need good roads. We also need um, good lighting system because the lighting on the streets are bad. Most of the streets are very dark. So sometimes you can rush to a code next door, but you can't do that because you are afraid it's in the dark. And we have a facility for the homeless around who sometimes actually um, go into cars that are parked around. So you, we, you, we, don't have, we don't feel safe to walk or run to the next door. We have to still go by our cars and use the same bad roads. So that's what I'm asking for. And, and maybe also if they can help us with um, structural repairs for the buildings, for especially the red bricks. The red bricks continually leak from the second floor to the uh, first floor. It has been repaired over and over again since I've been in that hospital and those leaks are still there. I believe it's structural. 
That is why our maintenance is not able to deal with it permanently. So I'm asking that that also could be looked into. And also for safety reasons, we need bathrooms upstairs in the bricks. Because when somebody has to use the bathroom, they'll have to go downstairs and leave one person only to watch 37 or 38 patients. That's dangerous for both staff and patients. Someone almost got killed when he was left alone by uh, his coworker about a year ago. He was alone and he, got, he got attacked because the coworker had to use the bathroom downstairs. So we need some of these things to be looked into and helped because uh, Spring Grove's budget can't reach these things. That's why I'm appealing to the budget committee to look into that for us. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Apuku. All right, Ms. Gilmore, that completes your panel, correct? No, uh, questions, okay, Delegate Henson. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Akuku, for your testimony. I've noticed you um, waiting attentively and listening to the other budgets for the entirety of our hearing. So I appreciate that um, you've been tuned in. Um, I want to ask the secretary, if I may, about, if I may, Madam Chair, about the, the points that were raised um, to see if there's anything in the facility master plan that would address the roads there and the leaking and the need for additional restrooms. Thank you, Delegate Henson. Mr. Secretary? Yes, thank you, Delegate. Uh, in our analysis of the Spring Grove uh, property, we've determined that many of the things that were, were said are true, uh, but this has been uh, deteriorating for the last 20 or 30 years. And we've gotten to the point now where the property is functionally obsolete. And we believe that uh, we are going to be needing to replace these facilities, not just throw a Band-Aid on them, unfortunately, which is why we are pushing uh, forward. And, uh, yeah, and there are a lot of obsolete properties. We actually, to give you an example, had our Office of Healthcare Quality in a building on that campus that is now empty and we moved and they had a terrible time recruiting and we moved them out to a uh, site uh, in Howard County and they're doing wonderfully out there in a modern building so we believe we have to have the, some of these buildings are so old that uh, investing capital in them would not be a good good use and not a good outcome because medicine has changed so much over the last 40 or 50 years. And, and if, if, thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I just wanted to also comment that uh, we, we thank all the employees for their dedicated service. Um, we consider all our healthcare workers heroes and we greatly dedicate their dedication and, and, and hard work at our facilities, especially during COVID. Um, we, we are aware of many of these issues and concerns and uh, maintenance staff at all our facilities, including Spring Grove Hospital, are in close coordination with the MDH Office of Facilities Management and Development to address these types of issues. Um, and we're certainly looking at um, uh, different, different avenues and mechanisms for, for coordinating, whether it's operating funds or capital funds to make improvements. Um, even if we are to transition services out of a facility over a period of time, we'll still need to maintain that facility um, for adequate patient care and safety. So we will continue to do so um, for the foreseeable future for each uh, campus based on the schedule uh, outlined in the facilities master plan. Um, but, you know, these things are being raised and, and there's a lot of coordination and we're identifying funding and, and uh, contract vehicles um, to make necessary repairs as needed. Do you have a follow-up? Mr. Chaudhary, it's good to hear you um, acknowledge the need to continue um, the upkeep and the care of the facilities as long as they're the workplace for our state employees and they're the residential care site for the persons that are there receiving treatment. Um, I wanted to understand the timeline to have things um, addressed like those that were raised here as concerns in the hearing. If they wanted to get the roads repaved, get those type of uh, patchwork done that would prevent the leaks, well, how does something like that get elevated to the maintenance staff? And then what's the timeline or the expectations you have in place for completing that? Um, 
Thank you, Delegate, for your question. Um, yes, so the, typically um, on campus when there are issues that are identified, they're raised to maintenance. Uh, maintenance has uh, capabilities to do repairs and do contracting in order to, to uh, address issues on site. Uh, once it passes a certain threshold, they coordinate with the Office of Facilities Management and Development at MDH for, for high-level repairs um, and, and coordination on, on there. We also coordinate with the Department of General Services for major repairs and um, uh, all uh, architectural engineering and large construction projects are funneled through. Um, Department of General Services, whom we coordinate very closely with, um, but we are we are looking at all avenues here. The, the one incident at the, at the Red Bricks, I know, uh, was identified um, in the fall of 2021. Um, recommendations have been made for repair, and I, I believe Spring Grove is, is coordinating um, with the, with headquarters team of, of uh, Office of Studies Management Development to address that the, the leaks in, in in the Red Bricks. Thank you, Delegate Henson. I see that Chair Resnick has returned. Go to Delegate Young and Chair Resnick will pick up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to, one, I, you addressed this with Delegate Henson's question a little bit related to timeline, but related to the master facilities plan, Spring Grove isn't even mentioned until 10 years into this plan. Is that accurate? Let me, uh, uh, let me take the beginning of that. We are beginning the planning process, so we're not waiting on the planning. So if opportunities present themselves, for example, uh, we've made it public that we are going to move the Behavioral Health Administration headquarters to the downtown uh, site when we consolidate uh, MDH, and that RFP is on the street with DGS. So once that is uh, done, then there'll be other opportunities to move some things around. And we are looking at various uh, options around Central Maryland for uh, possible uh, uh, facilities that rather than the state investing, if, the, if there are if there's excess healthcare facility capacity in the state, and we're working with uh, the healthcare commission and the uh, Health Services Resource Commission uh, on that excess capacity. So, uh, for example, if we were to find uh, excess capacity in a hospital because uh, the buildings are downsizing, we might be able to, and they're newer facilities, we might be able to move in with our operations in a quicker time frame. So we and think the entire process will take you know, 10 to 15 years, but we're not waiting. We're starting now to, to plan to see what sure. options might be available. I guess and we wanted to have this conversation mm -hmm. with the legislature now in public so that uh, as we're beginning this planning, we'll have a give and take on these issues. Sure. Yeah, a plan moves forward and adjusts as you get more information. I get that point. I guess what I'm trying, that's great for the administration, the folks that are going to be working in these brick homes, and my understanding is, from past attempts to move folks, consolidate, find better facilities that there's, I mean, at the present time, unless I know you're going into this process of trying to find locations, there's nowhere to put these folks to provide the services that the state's providing to these people. I mean, is that accurate? I mean, if tomorrow we needed to move them, there isn't a state or private facility within Maryland to move them to. That's my understanding. Uh, I'm not sure. There, there are, we are finding options. We're just in the exploratory phase, so mm -hmm. it's premature to get into it. But yep. there yep. are some. We also intend at some point, once we go through the initial phases, uh, where we are imagining a, a new facility at Springfield Hospital because we have mm -hmm. a lot of property there also. Sure. So, sure. And I, I, the last thing that Mr. Uh, Aduku brought up was about the roads and you're, I've been there, there, you know, some of the issues that happen with security there when there is a code that's called and folks need to rush from one end to the other. And he's not wrong. If you have ever spent any time, which I know you have, Mr. Secretary, on that property, it is not safe to be driving as fast as you possibly can to get to a, a, one of those buildings on the other side of the campus uh, and expect to do it safely. I mean, it's just, it, these are infrastructure things that, as you know, 
need to be taken care of regardless of what the plan is 10 years from now. Um, so I just, I'm just hoping that there's, especially because of the facility and the service they provide, that there's consideration brought to the fact that in order to function properly, that these roads need to be an appropriate, uh, uh, main, maintained properly. It doesn't seem like they're being done that way right now. So thank you for the time, Madam Chair. And thank you, Delegate, for your, for your for your comments there. And we are working very closely um, to utilize both operating as well as capital funds as necessary to do continue to maintain um, our facilities um, because of patient in order to maintain patient care standards and to ensure that we're still in compliance with Joint Commission standards. Um, and we're going to continue maintaining these going forward. So uh, even though Spring Grove may not be identified for a transition, you know, in phase three, obviously we're going to spend significant amount of, of funding between now and the point of transition to maintain that facility. So uh, absolutely agree we'll be doing that with, with, the, with the site. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional questions either for the APSME panel or for the department? All right, seeing none, I want to thank everyone for coming to testify. Again, I want to apologize and uh, beg everyone's indulgence for my quick little 12 minute jump, but it looks like I was able to make it back in time for the next budget. So I'm glad that we're able to do that. So with that, we're now going to do the budget, the FIPA budget and move to our analyst, Ann Wagner. Great, right. thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm just gonna share my screen so I can walk through the analysis. Um, as you said, today I'm presenting the budget analysis for the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration under the Department of Health. Um, you can see from uh, the first chart in this analysis that the budget decreases by about $500 million, largely in federal funds related to the COVID-19 pandemic. When excluding COVID-19 spending, the fiscal 23 allowance actually increases, um, and this is driven by about $12.3 million in additional general fund spending. Moving on to the performance analysis section on page five, um, this, uh, the first item relates to the state's recent efforts to prevent and manage diabetes. Under the total cost of care model, Maryland chooses population health domains for the state's entire healthcare system to prioritize, and um, one of these approved domains is diabetes prevalence. So this first exhibit shows Maryland's rank, among other states, in diabetes-related measures. Um, this was published as part of an initial evaluation of the total cost of care model, and you can see that overall, Maryland is roughly in the middle um, compared to other states on these measures. Um, to uh, further coordinate the healthcare system's efforts on reducing diabetes prevalence, the Department of Health published the State Diabetes Action Plan. Um, goals included in this action plan are listed on, page, on the bottom of page five. Um, and the department has set up a dashboard for this data um, or for the, uh, for the specific measures outlined in these goals. Um, but when this analysis was drafted, the dashboard was still down due to the ransomware attack. So the department is asked to comment on when the dashboard will be brought online again. Um, exhibit three presents some of the measures that, are, that were tracked outside of the dashboard. Um, over the period, you can see that the diabetes mortality rate improved slightly since 2011, um, but otherwise diabetes and obesity prevalence both grew worse since 2011. Um, and so this increased uh, focus on diabetes has led to multiple new programs and efforts across the state. Some of the department specific efforts are shown in the middle of page seven. Um, and then another funding opportunity made available is $86.3 million in um, five-year grants for hospital partnerships through the, through the HSCRC's regional partnership catalyst grant program. Um, these grants mainly support uh, diabetes prevention programs, which are year long lifestyle change programs and di diabetic uh, self-management training sites. So then moving on to the next performance analysis item, um, this relates to the state's contact tracing efforts during the pandemic. Exhibit four on page nine shows that the department reported contact tracers reached over 75% of people with a positive COVID case in most weeks since June, 2020. Um, in late December, however, of 20, um, 2021, you can see that the COVID positivity rate jumped. Um, this was during the surge related to the Omicron variant. And you can see contact tracers only reached about half of positive cases at that time. 
Although the department has published these measures consistently, it's not clear whether any benchmarks or goals were set for the state's contact tracing efforts. Um, a portion of the federal aid for the pandemic was also spent on rapidly expanding contact tracing infrastructure. And so since this is used in public health for other conditions, there could be future use for this infrastructure to some degree for those other conditions. And so the department is asked to discuss whether contact tracing has been effective in limiting the spread of COVID-19, uh, if the department set any specific goals for these measures, and how, this, how the new contact tracing infrastructure might be transitioned for ongoing public health uses. Moving on to the uh, budget discussion for this analysis, um, in fiscal 22, FIPA's budget has grown significantly due to CDC grant funding for the state's pandemic response. Exhibit five shows broad categories for how this funding was used. You can see that data systems, IT, and teleworking expenses made up the largest share at 31%. And then the next largest share of funding came through the American Rescue Plan Act as a grant that was specifically meant for testing, PPE, and cleaning supplies to help keep schools, op um, to help keep schools open or help them reopen. Um, and then other major public health efforts were also supported with these grants, including testing capacity, contact tracing, and vaccine distribution. Um, but a lot of these efforts were also supported with other federal aid like FEMA reimbursement. Exhibit six shows how the fiscal 23 allowance falls sharply by about $460 million in its COVID spending compared to fiscal 22, where you're seeing the um, majority of the uh, spending budgeted. Um, however, over the past two years, a lot of the COVID-19 related funding has been added through the budget amendment process outside of session and through supplemental budgets. So it is still possible that there could be some amount of additional federal funds added later for COVID expenses. The department is asked to provide an update on how much funding still needs to be added to the budget and if, uh, and if there's a timeline for adding those funds. The department's also asked to discuss whether the fiscal 22 budget is sufficient to cover recent surge expenses and how ongoing public health costs like maintenance for new data systems will be covered once the um, one-time federal aid ends. So then next, moving on to the fiscal 23 allowance, I'll briefly highlight two items. Uh, the first is that there is, um, excuse me, uh, the first is that there's $9.6 million in general funds added to meet a mandated funding level for tobacco prevention and cessation activities. Um, the digital advertising tax bill from 2021 increased the mandated level for these activities to $18.25 million annually. And so this increased funding supports local tobacco control programs, media contracts, and grants. Um, there is also funding for uh, maternal and child health uses. Um, since this was discussed in the MDH overview, I won't go into too much detail about this, but I did want to note that a bill from 2021 increased the mandated level for the prenatal and infant care grant program to 1.1 million, um, while the fiscal 23 allowance only includes 1 million total, so it's just, uh, it's funded just under that mandated level. Under personnel, uh, FIPA continues to report more vacancies than their budgeted turnover, so the department's asked to comment how, on how it will fill about 24 and a half vacancies to meet that turnover. And then MDH should also discuss how it has been tracking regular and contractual personnel funded with federal aid, um, specifically the federal aid related to the pandemic, as the budget reflects a net increase of 16 point, or yeah, 16.2 uh, contractual positions, um, while COVID-19 federal funds fall sharply in fiscal 23. Um, there are three issues that I'll present briefly today. The first has to do with school-based health center grants administration, which is transitioning from the Maryland State Department of Education to the Department of Health um, as required in um, 2021 legislation. The fiscal 23 allowance reflects this transition with FIPA showing $9.1 million in total funds for this program. This includes $6.5 million in special funds from the Blueprint for Maryland's Future Fund. Um, and this is because increasing funding for expanding school-based health centers was one of um, the blueprint initiatives. I will note too that MSD didn't have any dedicated staff supporting these grants. So the department doesn't gain any positions to take on these responsibilities and, is, and currently plans to administer the program with existing positions. Um, exhibit nine uh, shows a detailed timeline for how the transition is taking place, um, which will go into full effect in the beginning of fiscal 23. Um, and so I won't go into full detail of this, uh, but you can see 
uh, the department still has some activities left um, in fiscal 22 um, ahead of that transition. So considering the additional blueprint funds allocated to this program, um, the department is asked to discuss how many new centers would be added per year or how that funding would be used otherwise. Uh, if the department has strategies to recruit or provide outreach to healthcare providers or sponsoring agencies and schools for additional school-based health centers, and if the department plans to implement any recommendations that were outlined by the, um, the Council on Advancement of School-Based Health Centers. Moving on to the second issue, this relates to the state's AIDS drug assistance program. Under this program, the state receives rebates on any pharmaceuticals purchased above a certain price set by the federal government. And these rebates can then be used on services listed on page 22, um, including um, healthcare services and um, other uh, services for people with HIV or AIDS. Um, in the past few years, FIPA has maintained a large fund balance of these rebates. Um, at the close of fiscal 21, the, the fund balance was at just under $60 million. And most recently, these rebates were underspent, um, mainly due to the pandemic, which caused programs to temporarily close and limit services. At the same time, the department has just recently upgraded its MADAP program case management system IT project to be a major IT project, um, but the out-year costs are currently supported with general funds only, despite having this um, balance of rebate funds. Um, in fiscal 23, there's about $2.1 million in rebate funding budgeted, so it's not clear why those out years um, aren't budgeted with rebate funds. Uh, and so the department should discuss a spending plan for the rebate fund balance and explain why the MADAP major IT project doesn't have rebate funds budgeted in the out years. Um, the other item related to the um, MADAP program is that the MDH ransomware attack has impacted this program as employees can't access the client database. This has meant that MDH has to use workarounds for eligibility determinations for existing clients and that new clients cannot currently enroll. The department is asked to provide an update on this information system, including whether any long-term solutions have been put into effect for those eligibility determinations, um, how many existing and new clients have been impacted by these issues, and then how the department will provide outreach to any new clients who were temporarily um, unable to enroll in the program. Finally, the last issue has to do with the WIC program which provides food assistance and nutrition education um, to low-income women, infants, and children, um, children up to the age of five. Um, exhibit 10 reflects that recent enrollment changes, um, or reflects recent enrollment changes by eligibility group. Uh, total enrollment has steadily declined in each of the past five years. Um, you can see though that that rate of decline has slowed recently. Um, and in fiscal 21, the enrollment among children actually increased slightly. Uh, however, this was offset by the drop in women and infants served. Um, the other note in this issue is that the fiscal 22 budget included $9.7 million in enhanced WIC funding that was authorized in the American Rescue Plan. Um, and this funding allowed Maryland WIC to increase the cash value voucher to $35 per child and adult per fruits and vegetables for four months. Um, so this was in effect from June 21 to September 21. And the department is asked to discuss um, if, the, if that funding um, had any impact on increased enrollment over that time. And then also um, to discuss other factors causing enrollment among children to increase. Um, and generally the department should also provide an update on any new efforts to reach more people who are eligible for WIC but are not currently receiving benefits. Um, so other than that, the department or Department of Legislative Services recommends concurring with the allowance um, and that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Anne. Uh, are there any questions for the analyst? Seeing none, let's move to the department. We have uh, Secretary Schrader with us. I believe Dr. Chan is with you. Um, you know, with the distance uh, and the masks, it's really hard to know who's there. <laughs> uh, oh, but we appreciate, you. we appreciate you being here. Uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, good, af good afternoon or good evening, uh, Chair Resnick. Thank you for having us and members of the uh, subcommittee. Uh, for the record, my name is Dennis Schrader, uh, Health Secretary. Uh, we want to thank the governor and the budget committee's support for our COVID response efforts to date. And we wanna thank the Department of Legislative 
services in their budget analysis, uh, and particularly its recommendation to concur with the governor's allowance. Uh, one note that I wanted to say about the school-based health centers, and I, I, I must say that uh, we are very excited that this program is transitioning to the Department of Health and thank the legislature for that uh, action last year. We're, we're looking to go far beyond the current grant-funded mission and intend to use this opportunity to leverage Medicaid for these centers uh, to act as a population health force multiplier. 50.6% uh, of our health choice members are between the, uh, the ages of newborn and 20 years old. And we believe school-based health centers can be leveraged to assist in access to care delivery. Uh, of, it, it, to just give you an example, uh, our Medicaid uh, enrollment is somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.4 million uh, to 1.5, and uh, over 750,000 of those individuals are children, zero to 20. Uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Steve Hsu, <coughs> uh, our Health Finance and Medicaid Director, is uh, working with his team side by side with uh, Dr. Shelley Chu uh, from Dr. Chan's staff uh, to put in place the plans to transition uh, these school-based health centers. There's currently 90 of them in the state, uh, and we want to uh, find a way to expand that and make the ones we have uh, as, as effective as possible in providing care to uh, these, these children. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chan, Deputy Secretary for Public Health. She's going to give a brief summary of our written response. And after that, we'll take questions. We have Amy Lee Brandenburg, our CFO, Nick Maltano, uh, not Napolitano, our budget director, David Davis, Donald Google from PIPFA, and Webstreet available to answer questions as well. So, Dr. Chan, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee. Again, for the record, my name is Dr. Jinling Chan. I'm the Deputy Secretary for Public Health Services with the Maryland Department of Health, and I'm glad to be here with you this evening to talk about the budget for the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration. Um, I'd like to again thank Ms. Wagner for her detailed analysis um, of the budget and for her recommendation to support the allowance for uh, PHPA. This administration, as was outlined in the budget analysis, has responsibilities to address the key pillars of public health, including maternal and child health, environmental health, infectious disease surveillance and prevention, and cancer and chronic disease prevention and management. I would like to take a moment to recognize and thank the staff and the PHPA administration for their tireless work to protect people's health across the state. Whether it is to investigate foodborne outbreaks, ensuring safe drinking water, preventing cancer, or protecting infant health, the tremendous public health professionals at the Maryland Department of Health and in local health departments across the state have continued to ensure access to these critical public health services, even in the face of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of our highest priority population health goals, as has been outlined, are within the State Integrated Health Improvement Strategy, or SIHIS, and those continue to move forward under the leadership of the PHPA professionals including coordination to reduce maternal morbidity, reduce pediatric emergency room visits related to asthma, prevent diabetes, and prevent opioid overdose. I would like to turn to address some of the questions that Ms. Wagner raised in her analysis. So regarding diabetes, we do plan to update our existing data for the diabetes dashboard by this spring 2022, excuse me, 2022. Um, the latest 2019 metrics, which are um, just before we um, really started our work on the total cost of care and the SIHIS work um, related to the diabetes um, action plan are outlined in, your, uh, in the written response that you should have. Regarding contact tracing, um, per recent recommendations that were put forth by a number of national uh, public health associations and consistent with the CDC's revised guidance, 
we do plan to refocus um, our efforts regarding universal contact tracing to be more focused on targeted contact tracing with a focus on high-risk populations as well as high-risk settings, such as in congregate settings, nursing homes, as well as in outbreaks. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have built up an extensive infrastructure uh, to support contact tracing and are evaluating how this can be used in other public health contact tracing efforts. Regarding both the C CDC's ELC awards um, and the questions regarding the vacancies within PHPA, um, please do see our written response for the technical details, and we are happy to answer questions about this um, if any of the members have questions. We are currently actively recruiting to fill the vacant positions that are in PHPA, just like across all MDH units. And we'll consider how, as this response effort to COVID evolves, how we might be able to transition some of the contractual positions, um, assuming that they have appropriate skill sets and that we have permanent positions that may be a need. Um, we'll consider how we may be able to transition some of them to permanent positions. Regarding the school-based uh, health center program, um, as the secretary said, we are focused on transitioning this program by July 1, 2022, and have been working very closely with MSDE to ensure that. Um, <coughs> we are really reimagining the role of school-based health centers, um, not only for students and parents, but really in the context of our broader health system with total cost of care, um, with really improving population health. And we believe that school-based health centers can be an important tool for us um, as we move forward in the, uh, in the years to come. So to implement this transformation, MDH will be conducting a statewide needs assessment to inform the implementation of the school-based health center program's strategic priority, as well as areas of growth and structural development. The needs assessment will identify priority areas in Maryland for potential new uh, school-based health centers and will also help us in, uh, learn more about and help inform a sustainability model, um, which is really critical for us to continue to grow um, the program around the state. MDH intends to expand access to these services, not only increasing uh, utilization of currently available school-based health centers, so, you know, there are 90 programs across the state already, so we want to try to expand utilization of the ones that already exist. Um, but also, of course, very importantly, look at how we can expand um, and add additional jurisdictions that have school-based health centers and the number of schools with these programs. We appreciate the recommendations that have been provided by the Council on Advancement of School-Based Health Centers. Um, and as noted, actually, many of those recommendations we have already been implementing and um, have been providing updates to the Council, and we look forward to continuing those um, very, very um, uh, fruitful dialogue. As it relates to MADAP, um, COVID-19 has uh, impacted MADAP service utilization, and we expect that the FY23 expenditures will meet demand as services return to pre-pandemic levels. And so that's one of the reasons why we have um, kept the funding level fairly high. In terms of program access, um, MADAP has um, been working tirelessly since the network outage um, in December to implement manual workaround processes so that we can maintain coverage and access to needed medications and services for enrollees. At this time, we are able to provide services to recipients and we'll provide additional updates um, to providers and to recipients as needed and we are continually um, communicating with them. There have been 22 individuals who were new enrollees that have been impacted <coughs> and we have made sure that we, they were referred to other resources and uh, we'll continue to make sure that we stay in contact with them to ensure appropriate care coordination. Then 
Um, we would ask, however, with uh, people who may be impacted uh, in the MADAP program that they contact us directly um, if they look online on, our, on the MADAP website or call us. Um, our phone number is available and we are working individually with, um, with the, all of the enrollees to make sure that they do not lose access to care. And then finally, related to the question on the Women, Infants, and Children Supplemental Nutrition Program, early in the pandemic, as was noted in the analysis, um, we implemented waivers for physical presence to allow families to access WIC services by phone, um, and this has allowed enrollment to increase and for families to be retained. We have also convened recently a stakeholder group to discuss updated data and receive feedback and we'll work to share data with Medicaid and continue to explore other avenues so that we can enhance enrollment opportunities. So with that, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, we are happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Uh, are there any questions for the department from the members of the subcommittee? Seeing not, oh, Delegate Valentino-Smith. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the budget, I know it's late. I see, I think it's like $18.5 million for tobacco cessation and a lot going on with that program. Is there any effort or do you see any need to put money in for um, uh, more community instruction on cannabis use and cannabis smoke so or, or vaping or or any of the other things, a lot seems to be on tobacco. I'm just wondering your thoughts on cannabis. So I can also see if uh, Ms. Google may have a more specific response regarding the stipulations of that particular uh, uh, funding stream, but um, our efforts are focused on tobacco, but all forms of um, uh, you know, nicotine use, including vaping and electronic vaping, and in fact, um, I previously served as a commission member on the uh, can on the state's cannabis commission, and I know that there's been um, a lot of collaboration between our tobacco program and the uh, cannabis program in terms of exchanging information about vaping in particular. Yeah, hi, and this is Donna Google. And um, the the money that we're receiving is is most is for tobacco, not for cannabis. But we are. Um, partnering with the Cannabis Commission in all that we're doing. So I guess we'll have to count on the department to make recommendations on whether or not there's need for any programs going forward with respect to cannabis use and underage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I will just follow up with a question. Um, I know you all have been talking uh, extensively about the school-based health centers um, during this presentation. I appreciate it. I do want to ask the question specifically. I know parts of these questions have already been addressed, so I just want to get it all out in, in one tranche. Um, can you confirm that the school-based health centers currently bill through Medicaid for primary care, behavioral health, and any other services provided through a clinic? And did the transition from uh, the from MSD to, to Department of Health change this process at all? Um, and uh, will more children in Medicaid be reached through this transition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know the specific answer to that question, so if we could get back to you, I'd appreciate it. Uh, it is our intent to evaluate all the Medicaid processes because we want to expand that service. So uh, let us uh, get back to you on that, that if, you, if that would be okay. That would be great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Any additional Thank questions you. for the department? Seeing none, we have a few people signed up to testify, so we will switch to them now. Uh, we will start with um, Dr. Kevin Cullen, who has... Oh, he's here. I was enjoying the picture of your dog. <laughs> that, that's uh, Dr. Loki. He's a service dog that comes oh, to the okay. medical center um, and really uh, is great comfort to the, the staff who are taking care of uh, our sick patients. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee, given the hour, I'll be very, very brief and we'll defer to, to the, my submitted uh, testimony, but I just want to make a couple of points. I'm Kevin Cullen. I'm the 
Director of the Greenbaum Comprehensive Cancer Center. And I'm here today to express my appreciation on behalf of the center for the support we have received through the Cigarette Restitution Fund. Um, and I'm gonna give you a couple of very, very brief highlights of some milestones that we've achieved this year with CRF support. Um, as part of the multi-pronged efforts that the state has had ongoing for several decades now, cancer mortality in Maryland continues to decline. We've dropped from first in, in the country in 1990 uh, down into the mid thirties uh, among states today. So we've made great, great progress. Um, in 2021, we were very pleased uh, that we received a five year renewal of our NCI National Cancer Institute Comprehensive Cancer Center designation. That's the highest designation that is awarded to cancer centers around the country, along with our partners, Johns Hopkins across, across town. Um, and I, I presented some research highlights in my testimony, which I won't go over today. But what I will mention is one of the key things that we're very proud of in the Cancer Center is our efforts to engage our community and serve our community. In the last uh, five-year funding cycle, we enrolled more than 9,700 Marylanders on cutting edge uh, cancer clinical trials. And remarkably, 48% uh, of those people were underrepresented minorities. So we, we take uh, a great deal of effort to serve the needs of our Baltimore and Maryland community. Another key component uh, of an NCI designated cancer center is outreach to the community and training the next generation of scientists who will be the healthcare providers and the healthcare researchers in the future. Um, six years ago, we were the first center in the country to partner with the National Cancer Institute. We received a, a grant from the National Cancer Institute called the Cure Scholars Program. This was a, a, a program where we partnered with middle schools in West Baltimore um, to identify and, and mentor and train uh, students three times a week in STEM education. Uh, 150 volunteers from the university have partnered with more than 120 students from West Baltimore uh, over the last six years of this grant funded program. Um, the first cohort is about to graduate from high school and we're very, very pleased that relatively early in the college acceptance cycle, more than half of the, of the 20 uh, students in cohort one have already received college acceptances. One student has received 18 acceptances, including five uh, university system of Maryland universities. Another student has received uh, eight acceptances and over $100,000 in scholarships as a result of their participation in this, uh, this uh, innovative have had funded by the National Cancer Institute. Um, so these are just a couple of the highlights that I, I outline in, our, in my written testimony. And again, in the interest of time and the late hour, I will be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Next, we'll move to Otis Brawley. Oh, hello, I'm uh, here with Dr. Uh, is he here? Dr. B William Nelson from uh, the Kimmel Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start. It'd be easier. Okay. So um, sure. for the record, I'm Bill Nelson, director of the Kimmel Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins, and I am joining Kevin Cullen and thanking all of you for your strong and sustained support for the uh, uh, the Cigarette Restitution Fund and its support of cancer research, which really has actually delivered impactful discoveries, exciting commercial opportunities, and meaningful improvements in cancer detection, diagnosis, and treatment here in Maryland and throughout the country. And we're very much in support of the governor's proposed uh, budget for the Cigarette Restitution Fund. This year at, at Johns Hopkins, we're separately seeking support for a one-time investment of $2.5 million to the general funds mechanism for the purchase of state-of-the-art mass spectrometers. These are instruments capable of assessing an individual's level of exposure to tobacco and other pollutants via a blood test. And as you know, there are monitoring stations throughout the state and elsewhere to you know, catalog the pollutants in the atmosphere, but that doesn't really get at the individual's exposure. And the hope is by, by assessing that we can tailor uh, mitigation and other strategies to help them reduce their risk of lung cancer and other kind of dread diseases. Now, I, I do want to mention that these instruments will be part of a shared resource in the uh, Chemo Cancer Center at Hopkins, but it's shared not only by uh, researchers all throughout Johns Hopkins, but researchers at the University of Maryland. Together with the Greenbaum Cancer Center, we operate a consortium that enables high-end equipment to be available to all of our cancer researchers in the state. And uh, Kevin Cullen mentioned this incredible payoff which is the reduction from being number one in cancer mortality to now down in the 30s. I can't think of any better way to describe it. I did uh, ask Otis Brawley to come with us today because many of you have had questions 
about some of the interruptions in cancer screening and early detection uh, that were ongoing with the adaptations of the healthcare in the state for the co coronavirus pandemic that threatened to undermine a little bit of this progress. So I thought I'd just invite Otis to comment on that for you and be available for questions. Yes, hello, uh, and I'll be very brief. Uh, Dr. Cullen, Dr. Nelson, and I, I'm, by the way, I'm Otis Brawley, I'm Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Oncology and Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. Uh, we, the three of us are all very interested in public health and what's going on in public health. And the last two years of the COVID epidemic has led to a decrease in the amount of screening, decrease in the amount of number of people who are actually accessing health care. And also we're concerned about increases in alcohol intake, alcohol being a carcinogen, as well as increases in smoking, increases in uh, calorie consumption, the number two cause of cancer in the United States is actually obesity. Uh, that being said, we are putting together groups of community health educators to go around the state to doctor's offices, uh, to churches, to any kind of community group that'll listen to us to try to stress that people need to eat five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables per day, need to get adequate exercise, need to try to limit the amount of alcohol intake, need to not smoke at all, including e-cigarettes. Uh, and uh, we're trying to promote healthy environments to overcome the negativity that's occurred over the last two years of COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for uh, this panel? Seeing none, I wanna thank you all for coming to testify. Actually, you know what? I do have a question, I apologize. Dr. Cullen, you mentioned the, uh, was it Dr. Cullen or Dr. Nelson mentioned the additional one-time uh, funding? That was you, Dr. Nelson. Is that already in the budget? Uh, I think it's in the, it's not in, uh, it's in the general funds mechanism rather than the- But it's uh, in the governor's budget. Yeah. Okay, great, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you so much. Any additional questions? Seeing none, I wanna thank you all for testifying. Uh, I would like the subcommittee to stick around for a brief moment. Uh, we do have a, uh, a voting session on one small, uh, short bill. Um, and so hopefully we can do that relatively quickly. Um, I wanna thank everyone else for coming and uh, look forward to seeing you all again at the next budget hearing. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right, Geraldine, are you still with us? June, can you text her? Uh, she's there. Okay, so let's see if we can do this relatively quickly. Um, this is the, um, the, the bill that we have to consider is HB 447. It is sponsored by Delegate Stephanie Smith, and it is the bill that deals with the annual appropriation to the cash campaign. If you all recall, the cash campaign is the nonprofit organization that assists uh, uh, individuals with um, financial management, tax preparation, et cetera, folks who cannot afford those services themselves. Uh, the programs have been overwhelmingly successful. I believe that this annual appropriation, June, correct me if I'm wrong, but this isn't an increase, is it? This is just a, um, uh, an addition to uh, um, a codification of existing programs. It actually is an increase. It is an increase. Can you tell yes, me how much current statute is 200? And now it's five, the bill makes it 500 for fiscal year 2024. 500,000 per year. Okay, so um, that is the bill. Um, are there any questions on, on that? No? Okay. Um, we will, I'd like to take a vote if we can. Can I have a motion from someone? Motion move favorable. Thank you. Is there a second? Two. Second. Okay. All right, there we go. <laughs> all right, thanks everybody. Reach that uh, button fast enough. So all right, right, no worries. Uh, you do know you can press your space bar and that uh, temporarily unmutes you, right? Okay. Dangerous, yes, thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the bill? Seeing none, if we can take a vote, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We have one in opposition, Delegate Mangione. Um, and okay, the, so the vote is uh, 
four to one. All right. Sounds good. Um, and, and delegate Mangione, I, I say Mangione. Other people say Mangione. How do you pronounce your last name properly? I, I Mangione is hell, but every it's it's 50 50, but Mangione is hell. Okay. So, yeah. As someone who regularly has his name butchered, I want to be able to get it right. So, okay, uh, I got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. I think that concludes everything. This bill is going to be on the voting list for appropriations, I believe, this coming Friday. Um, and so we'll see you all later. I think we have bill hearings tomorrow. So, thank you all very much. I have to jump to a HGO subcommittee hearing for some reason, because they're talking about my bill. So I'll see y'all.